keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas A. Schwartz, distinguished professor of history, as well as professor of political science and European studies at Vanderbilt University. After earning two master's degrees in history, the first at Oxford University and the second at Harvard University, Professor Schwartz completed his doctorate in history at Harvard. Before moving on to Vanderbilt, he taught at his doctoral alma mater for five years. His first book, America's Germany, John J. McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, was published by Harvard University Press in 1991. In contrast to many US diplomatic historians, the appeal of his work transcends national boundaries. The German translation of his first monograph was published in 1992. His second monograph, Lyndon Johnson in Europe in the Shadow of Vietnam, was published in 2003 and bears great relevance to our present conference. But it was the publication of Professor Schwartz's latest book, Henry Kissinger and American Power, a Political Biography, that inspired our invitation to him. Published by Hill and Wang in 2020, amidst the worst of the coronavirus pandemic, Henry Kissinger and American Power has attracted much attention by both the academic and popular media. Personally, Henry Kissinger and American Power holds great significance for me for three reasons. First, his book mentions Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palma, unlike the memoirs of former President Richard M. Nixon and former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Second, in addition to traditional archival documents, Professor Schwartz makes extensive use of the Vanderbilt Television News Archive. He evaluates Kissinger as a media personality as well as a diplomat. Indeed, I first became aware of, quote, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, unquote, when I watched him on television as a small child. Back then, I assumed he had been President Jimmy Carter's Secretary of State because Carter was the only former president I could remember. And I'm sure that most of our audience first learned of Kissinger through the same medium. Finally, Professor Schwartz's book has helped place my own research in perspective. As a graduate student, I shared journalist Christopher Hitchens' contempt for Henry Kissinger. Since then, my opinion of Kissinger has not changed, even though it certainly has of Hitchens. But whether readers celebrate Kissinger or condemn him, Henry Kissinger and American Power will help them place um, Nixon's second Secretary of State within the context of highly developed political and diplomatic systems. No matter what Kissinger once said to Italian journalist Oriana Falacci, he was never a cowboy riding alone. Now, Professor Schwartz will deliver his keynote lecture. Peace is really at hand. Henry Kissinger, American Domestic Politics, and the Paris Peace Treaty of 1973. Professor Schwartz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Libna, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to do my best today. Um, we uh, we are trying. I've, I've decided. I'm trying to bring some of the uh, so that you don't have to just listen to me for an hour. Um, that we have Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon, Walter Cronkite, all sorts of other personalities. Whether that'll all work, we'll, we'll look. We'll wait and see. Um, the uh, uh, most of you know what Henry Kissinger looks like. This is his official portrait as Secretary of State. Um, my book was designed originally um, in a series that was attempting to teach history through biography. Um, and the idea was very short volumes that did so. I, I violated every tenet of that. But the idea was that through the biography of Henry Kissinger to get at something more fundamental about American foreign policy, the history of American foreign policy, history of American interaction with the world. And so in effect, what I was trying to do through Kissinger's career was try to come to some larger view of how to understand America's interactions with the rest of the world. Um, my sources were, of course, traditional the, the Kissinger papers. Kissinger is extraordinarily well documented uh, uh, be, between uh, the phone calls and other materials. His memoirs run over 4,000 pages, his own writings, the Nixon Library materials. There's all sorts of other uh, collections that exist. Um, in many respects, I, I, I uh, rather maybe over modestly said I'm a limited intervention into the Kissinger studies, but I expect that there will be lots of other Kissinger books, as there already have been, uh, coming out over the next years. Uh, 
I got bogged down a bit in the Nixon tapes, which were coming out as I was doing my research. The Nixon tapes are an extraordinary, uh, provide an extraordinary insight into the actual making of foreign policy and its discussion at the highest levels. And they also connect uh, with other sources, such as the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, which I confess is very much something that I got to use because that's my home university. And so being able to use the archive was a very great privilege. There's a long story. I've written a couple of pieces on a website called The Conversation about the difficulties of using the TV news archive legally uh, because of, of, of some restrictions that exist on its uh, uh, use by the networks, the television networks. Uh, but that uh, does not prevent, I think, people from getting at uh, the media role uh, during the Nixon presidency, and particularly the way in which foreign policy was communicated and conveyed to the American people. The title of my talk, Pieces Really at Hand, actually comes from the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, uh, the account uh, of Howard K. Smith as he was waiting for Henry Kissinger to arrive at his press conference of January 24th, 1973, where Kissinger would announce the Paris Peace Treaty. Uh, the idea of really at hand came from, of course, the fact that Henry Kissinger on October 26th, 1972, had announced that peace was at hand. And then after that, there was the Christmas bombing. There was uh, three months of, of turmoil before you actually got the peace settlement. So peace was really at hand on January 24th, that, or at least that was what Howard K. Smith believed and was presenting to the American people um, as Kissinger came for his news conference. Um, I want to start by talking about the argument of my book, since it influences how I present the Paris Peace Treaty. And I'll, I'll start from this quotation, that Kissinger is a foreign policy intellectual and advocate of real politique, that that's what most polit treatments do. They see Kissinger as pursuing a pragmatic and realistic foreign policy that promoted American security and the national interest, interests that were defined fairly narrowly in military and economic terms and downplayed moral, ethical considerations like human rights. I would argue that this understanding of Kissinger's approach is not wrong, but it's incomplete. I argue for the centrality of politics. Kissinger is a political actor. His self-presentation was as an independent and nonpartisan expert on foreign policy, but he recognized the centrality of politics and how deeply intertwined domestic and foreign politics are within the American system. Kissinger's skill with the media also enhanced his authority as the symbol of the Nixon Ford foreign policy. Now, let me just add an addendum here to avoid misunderstanding. Highlighting domestic political influence on particular decisions is not deterministic. In 1958, Henry Kissinger appeared on a program called The Mike Wallace Interview. Mr. Wallace questioned Mr. Kissinger about relations between the United States and Soviet Union, the concept of limited war. He often gives the impression of being so infatuated with the mechanics of foreign policy and with the negotiation aspect of foreign policy that he has not succeeded in projecting the deeper things we stand for and often has created great distrust abroad. Who, if any, are the men in public life whom you admire, you personally admire and look to for leadership for the United States, Dr. Kissinger? Well, I must say first of all that I'm here as a nonpartisan, uh, that I'm an independent. Understood. I, I don't stand for either party in this. Uh, this depends. Uh, I've respected Mr. Stevenson uh, in many of his utterances, respected Mr. Atchison in many of his utterances, although I've disagreed with him uh, very much uh, on other things. Uh, it's very difficult for a party out of power to prove what it can do. But there is no, there is no Republican who comes readily to your mind in whom you have that, that confidence that that man has an understanding, the understanding that we need to lead us at this time. I hate to, to engage in personalities. Uh, I, I think that Mr. Nixon in his public utterances recently has, has shown awareness of, of this. Fascinating here is the fact that um, Kissinger, although he describes himself as a nonpartisan, was at the time working for Nelson Rockefeller. 
who was a liberal Republican, and Kissinger was actually very active in uh, sort of devising Rockefeller's strategies and the rest. Um, what, what's interesting is his self-presentation was as a nonpartisan. Um, I don't need to probably go through most of Kissinger's career right now. It would take quite a while, but Kissinger, of course, was a refugee from Nazi Germany um, who, uh, uh, through his army service, became connected uh, to uh, a, a series of mentors who helped him get to Harvard University, where he's excelled, um, became a professor there at Harvard, but also was a uh, public intellectual, writing a book on limited nuclear war that became a bestseller in the 1950s. And Kissinger's prestige as a one of the early defense intellectuals was certainly there. Um, he, uh, 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 Kissinger worked for Rockefeller um, through the 1960s. Um, he had a brief period of time in the Kennedy administration working on issues related to Germany and Berlin. Um, he also then worked in the Johnson administration dealing with secret negotiations with North Vietnam. And in the 1968 election, he again worked for Rockefeller, deeply disappointed with his uh, defeat. He stayed involved in the Paris negotiations and he actually warned Nixon of a bombing bomb um, and the possibility of an October surprise. This first was revealed in Seymour Hersh's uh, very negative views of, of uh, Nixon. Um, in his book in 1983 on, on Kissinger and power. Um, but what it gets at, what, 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 we, uh, what it gets at is that Kissinger had connections to both sides of the aisle, the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, Nixon did tell the South Vietnamese not to come to the negotiating table. Um, I think to a certain extent, my argument would be that the South Vietnamese knew full well not to come to the negotiating table. So the idea that this was as uh, significant as, as uh, Lyndon Johnson would later consider uh, as treason, I think is a bit overstepping it, but he wasn't referring to Kissinger's warning. And uh, even though Christopher Hitchens does put this as a central part of his indictment of Kissinger, I think it's um, really overstated. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger um, were an odd couple from the beginning. But Kissinger's appointment was announced even before the Secretary of State's appointment. And here, I'm going to try, um, uh, technically, to give you a, a sense of what you can learn from the television archive. And it's an interesting example of Kissinger's introduction to the American people in November of night or December of 1968. $50. President-elect Nixon today named Dr. Henry Kissinger, the German-born Harvard professor, as his White House policy advisor on defense and foreign affairs. In the planning of foreign policy, Nixon said he intends to seek the advice of experts in allied nations. Dan Rather reports. Kissinger long has argued that the U.S. must use its power more subtly. He is more expert about Europe than Asia, believes no strictly military solution is possible in Vietnam, but opposes a unilateral pullout. He was asked about reports that he is a hardliner on Vietnam. But I have been uh, expressing my views uh, publicly on international affairs for the last 15 years. And I have tried to avoid labels like hard and soft and express my best judgment on the substance. Therefore, I find it very difficult to characterize myself. As for the idea of actively soliciting the advice of private foreigners, Kissinger named Alistair Buchan of London's Institute for Strategic Studies as an example. Mr. Nixon was asked if all this might not be resented in his State Department. Of course, the Secretary of State uh, is the chief foreign policy advisor to the President of the United States. Uh, as far as the uh, government is concerned generally, uh, there must be the very closest relationship between the Secretary of State and the White House staff. Uh, Dr. Kissinger is keenly aware of the necessity uh, not to set himself up as a wall between the President and the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense. A one-time Whittier College end, Mr. Nixon took time out to greet All-American footballers, Ohio State's Dave Foray, Georgia's Bill Stanfield, Notre Dame's Terry Hanratty, and Southern Cal's O.J. Simpson. I'll stop it there. Um, it is one of the gems of the TV archive is that you occasionally find things like the president greeting OJ. Um, that 
particular clip underlined several things. One is, of course, how Kissinger presented himself, but Richard Nixon already saying that he knows that this is going to be a problem with the Secretary of State, but basically saying exactly the opposite of what Kissinger would do, namely that Kissinger would bring foreign policy into the White House and uh, largely exclude the Secretary of State. So it's a, it's a fascinating bit to give you some sense of, of how Kissinger's approach or, um, was brought in. Um, I originally, when I started doing this paper, um, I, I had not initially thought of the Korean uh, issue in the way in which this conference is trying to bring it to, to um, uh, highlight. And I thought that one thing I would do is try to connect the Vietnam and Korean War peace settlements in a way that I had not originally intended. And one is to argue that Richard Nixon did operate initially on the Korean analogy, that when he talked in the 1968 campaign, for example, of a plan to end the war in Vietnam, it was a plan to follow what he thought Eisenhower had done in Korea, namely the idea of using threats and promises, um, particularly even nuclear threats, uh, to uh, end the Soviet Union's intervention to get an end of the war. And in fact, Kissinger or uh, Nixon did indeed use Kissinger as a back channel to Anatoly Dobrynin early in the administration, um, where he tried to convey the warning that Nixon was possibly willing to use um, uh, severe military force against Vietnam um, if there were not a peace settlement. Uh, the bombing, the secret bombing of Cambodia undertaken in March of 19. Uh, 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 69, was particularly intended to signal to the North Vietnamese and to the Soviets that indeed uh, Nixon was willing to take steps um, that uh, Johnson and had, had not been willing to do to end the war. The interesting thing is that Kissinger arranges this dinner with Dobrynin, where he um, actually uh, highlights in secrecy the, the uh, degree to which Nixon is willing to use force um, right before the North Korean shootdown of the EC-121, which confirmed in a way the lack of US military options and the overextension of American military power and underlined the difference in the balance of power in 1969 compared to 1953 and the attitudes of the American people who feared another Korean war as well as a Vietnam war and actually put a certain degree of constraint on how Nixon would respond to the North Korean shootout, which he did not respond to as forcefully as um, he wanted. In that sense, the failure to end the war despite the public assurances, and one has to recall, and I bring about in my book, there were a number of assurances early in 1969 that the war would be over in six months, that this would be ended quickly. And part of that was the belief that it could be ended through a combination of threats to the North Vietnamese plus the intervention of the Soviets, which was hoped to, to do this. Nothing happened in this regard. Kissinger, in fact, would uh, author his famous salted peanuts memo, where he talked about the withdrawal of troops being like salted peanuts to the American people, something they would want eventually to uh, continue. Um, and Nixon's silent majority speech, which rallied uh, support for his policy, still was designed with the idea of a Vietnamization and slow ending of the war. Uh, Nixon, of course, uh, compounded this problem with his intervention in Cambodia and the subsequent domestic uproar at Kent State. Um, all of this led to Kissinger by the end of the first term of the administration, beginning a discussion with a reporter with the discussion that you can't lose them all in foreign policy when the United States had a brief success in the Middle East. The midterm elections were uh, particularly devastating to Nixon. Uh, Republicans gained uh, two seats in the Senate, but lost nine in the House. Nixon thought he might be a one-term president. Um, uh, he considered uh, making an end of the war announcement. Um, he wanted to highlight Kissinger's role. Kissinger decides to stay at this point. There's another TV uh, 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 announcement of this. I'm gonna skip this one though because of time and I'll just move ahead. Um, the early part of 1971 was particularly the time of frustration uh, for uh, Nixon, uh, the defense of the invasion of Laos, which had gone very badly. For the first time, Nixon brought Kissinger in on television for this. And I'll just show a brief clip here of, of Kissinger defending the policy in 1971. Let's see if I can get this. This is one of the first Kissinger uh, real appearances. Kissinger had a low profile originally because the administration was concerned that his German accent would remind people of Dr. Strangelove and 
a sort of a, a suspicious, uh, uh, and they th thought it would not play in Peoria, as they put it. The chief foreign policy advisor to President Nixon, Dr. Henry Kissinger, was interviewed on the CBS Morning News today. John Hart and Bernard Kalb asked for his assessment of the Laotian operation and the communist victories over the South Vietnamese. When there is a battle going on, uh, one side isn't going to win all the engagements. Given the nature of the terrain, given the nature of the operations, one has to expect that the South Vietnamese forces in Laos, and for that matter in uh, South Vietnam, will suffer an occasional uh, setback. Uh, the problem is whether the South Vietnamese will be able eventually and in a measurable period of time, in a much shorter time, a uh, decade, I, I know you didn't mean as a, as a phrase because we're not talking about, uh, about a time frame that is even remotely uh, that extended, uh, uh, whether they will be able to, uh, uh, to defend themselves and stand on their own feet. Well, it's, it's a novel problem because so far it's North Vietnam that's uh, invaded all all the neighboring countries and you've just been uh, asked North Vietnam, the idea that any of the South Chinese Vietnam countries invaded. might be invading North Vietnam would have been unthinkable uh, even a year ago so that the uh, so that the <clears throat> this indicates a certain evolution in the in the relative balance of strength uh, any chance the, the evolution becoming a reality well, it's not the dominant uh, probability at this moment. Well, who would this not the dominant probability was a polite way of saying they did not expect uh, the North, the South Vietnamese, to be invading um, the North. Um, on the Nixon tapes, Nixon gave a speech on the Laotian invasion where he talked about. Uh, it is a great success. It was an early example of trying to spin something that was a failure into a success. Um, this is at the beginning, the Nixon tapes start up in February of 1971. So this is one of the earlier tapes in which one gets a sense of the relationship between Kissinger and Nixon. And I'll just play a, be a bit at the beginning here because it gives some of the flavor of uh, both uh, Nixon's insecurity and Kissinger's rather constant flattery of him in order to um, help his particular position. Yeah, the president. Yeah, hi, Henry. This was the best speech you've delivered since you've been in office. I don't. Well, I don't know. I think no, November third was better, but uh, no, but we will never have a moment. We'll never have a moment like that again. Well, the November third speech was not well delivered, Mr. President. If yeah. you remember, yeah, it was a powerful speech. Yeah, this one was really movingly delivered. Uh, and well, I don't know whether you saw the commentary afterwards. Of course, I don't look at the commentary. Well, I, don't care what, I don't care what the bastards say. Well, but this is so amazing. John, first of all, no one was fly specking it. Mm -hmm. John Chancellor was very favorable. Uh, everyone is saying a strong man sticking to his guns, mm -hmm. uh, carrying out his policy, not being driven off. Dan Rather, very positive. Marvin Kauf, very positive. Mm -hmm. The only guy who was fly specking it a little bit is the, is the Pentagon correspondent mm. who had been... How about Howard Smith? How would he do? Uh, he would not. Uh, at least I didn't see him. Yeah. I'll say one thing. This was a, this little speech was a work of art. I recommend the entire conversation um, to, to capture something of this. Um, all the figures that Kissinger is referencing are TV commentators. Um, and Nixon was, despite his reference to the bastards who he didn't listen to, very concerned with how they presented and conveyed what he did. Um, the Nixon, the Laotian invasion was probably one of the low points in the presidency of Nixon in the sense that people wanted an end to the war. Shortly after this speech, things began to break for Nixon, particularly um, in China. Um, uh, and the, uh, this tape, this tape gives some impression. This was right the week of the ping pong diplomacy. And again, one of the reasons I'd like to, to just reference this conversation is it gives some idea of how attached the administration was to its television coverage. Mr. President. Hello, Henry. 
I was wondering how they, uh, have you checked in to see what, how they played the Chinese thing today? Oh, yeah, it was tremendous. It was the lead item on every, I didn't see it myself. I was with Bob Griffin, but I talked to Haig. Yeah? But he says it's been a tremendous thing on television. It's been the lead item on every uh, television thing. And so I, I, rather than Vietnam for a change. <laughs> yeah, it's gone on and on and on. Yeah. And I found it helpful also with these Michigan editors. Kissinger then goes on to talk about coverage and his own attempts to explain the policy in Vietnam um, at that time. But it, it gives you some idea of how connected they were to how the policies were presented. China, of course, becomes the uh, new, and this was the beginning of Kissinger as a extraordinary celebrity. His role in the secret trip to China um, elevated him in American media fascination. Um, with him as the secret representative of the president carrying out these extraordinary moves in diplomacy. And he would be on the cover of Time magazine repeatedly over the next several months. Um, in fact, um, at a time when TV or magazines were the dominant media uh, in American establishment media, Newsweek and Time particularly, he was on the cover of both in the uh, period when it was announced first that he had been conducting secret negotiations with North Vietnam. Um, and I'll, I'll play the beginning of this. This is the coverage after President Nixon announced the, uh, the fact that he had been conducting secret negotiations with uh, the Vietnamese in, early, in January of 1972. And it's interesting to hear how Kissinger is presented again by the, uh, uh, by the news media. And David Culhane in New York. Good evening. Since President Nixon revealed last night his latest eight-point proposal for peace in Indochina, the reaction has been swift, but not altogether heartening. The communists, for instance, dismissed Mr. Nixon's statement as propaganda and said it was perfidious. Further, they chided the president for allegedly breaking a promise to keep the secret talk secret. But the communists stopped short of actually rejecting the proposal. In Washington, presidential advisor Henry Kissinger discussed the plan and his many secret trips to Paris to negotiate with the communists. Dan Rather reports. The White House East Room was turned into a stage setting for Dr. Kissinger's performance. Besides starring in the Nixon administration as Secretary of State without title, swinging bachelor ladies' man, and the president's secret negotiator, Kissinger is widely acclaimed as a masterful explainer of White House policy. Some call him a briefer, others a propaganda artist, all agree he is skillful. But Kissinger usually does his explaining on a don't quote me, don't use my name basis. Today, as part of a carefully orchestrated White House effort to enlist support for the president's war policy and peace proposals, Kissinger made one of his rare on the record appearances. No sound cameras or recording equipment were allowed, but silent filming was, and reporters were free to quote Kissinger directly by name. These were his major points. The this gives you some idea, Kissinger still was not being used as a uh, direct White House uh, figure, and that would not come until later in the year. Um, particularly the first time Kissinger would actually speak on the record would be at the um, October 26th briefing when he would announce pieces at hand, um, even though he would appear on these interviews occasionally beforehand. Uh, the North Vietnamese, of course, uh, launched their Easter offensive in 1972, um, and uh, their attacks across the the, the, were designed essentially to undermine Nixon in the midst of the 1972 campaign and also to achieve victory. Um, Nixon launched Operation Linebacker, the massive bombing of North Vietnam. And in his May 8th speech to the nation, it is plain that what appears to be a choice among three courses of actions, the killing must stop by simply getting out. We would only worsen the bloodshed, relying solely on negotiations. The time needs to press his aggression on the battlefield. There's only one way to stop the killing as to take the weapons of war out of the hands of the international outlaws of North Vietnam. This was an extraordinary gamble, Nixon's bombing and the mining of the harbor of Haiphong. Um, it went against Kissinger's own advice. Kissinger's political advice was to essentially not uh, take the, the, the risk of losing the su summit with the Soviet Union in May of 1972 by taking forceful military action. Um, Kissinger was wrong. Nixon was right on this one. Um, the Soviets didn't cancel the summit, and North Vietnam would be pressured to settle by uh, the Soviets and China over the course of the rest of the year. Um, George McGovern's campaign, which the North Vietnamese had put a great deal of stock in, 
uh, imploded in the summer of 1972 after his nomination for president. Um, he picked a vice president who turned out to have had uh, serious uh, depression issues. Um, McGovern initially said he was back again, then dropped him and picked another uh, vice presidential candidate, but dropped in the polls significantly. Kissinger, Nixon had in 1972 orchestrated a foreign policy series of successes that had done masterful things for his domestic political standing. His trip to China, which was choreographed for television news, um, his successful trip to the Soviet Union, the signing of the SALT Agreement, despite the bombing of North Vietnam. And finally, the idea was, um, and this was of course one, one of the things that uh, uh, actually occurred, and I'll, I'll briefly mention this, uh, when William Sapphire, who was working for the New York Times, or would come to work for the New York Times, and Henry Kissinger strolled through downtown Warsaw, reflecting on the results of the Moscow summit, Sapphire remarked, been one hell of a week, Henry. What does the president do for an encore? Kissinger didn't hesitate, make peace in Vietnam. And in a sense, the trifecta, uh, the three successes were designed along the political element of reelecting Richard Nixon. Um, here I want to plunge into where I had originally started uh, my discussion of the uh, peace talks and the po domestic politics of it. There are a, a series of historical controversies about the end of the war in Vietnam, in particular on the American negotiating side. Was Kissinger, for example, more interested in the settlement before the election than Nixon was? And this is something that uh, is featured in a number of works, um, earlier works on this. Kissinger thought an October agreement would work. Nixon was more committed though to making sure Saigon didn't collapse. And here I think recognizing that there's a continuity here between the Kissinger who was already advising Nixon against risking the Soviet summit and also hoping for an agreement by the end of before the election. Whereas Nixon was more committed not to seeing Saigon collapse on his watch and in a way that he could be blamed. North Vietnam clearly did want an agreement before the election. They accepted the conditions that Nixon presented on May 8th in his speech, which he announced the bombing of uh, and the mining of the harbor on Haiphong. So in effect, they, they did this. There is a absolutely terrible TV movie on this subject um, called Kissinger and Nixon, which presents um, Kissinger um, in a particular way. I'll just um, briefly quote, I, I had, my editor uh, uh, insisted I put it in the footnote because I, I had it in the main text, but um, in effect, um, uh, Isaacson's book became, Walter Isaacson's biography was used as the basis for this television movie, Kissinger and Nixon, which dramatized the conflict between the two men in almost cartoonish fashion. The Nixon character wants to keep the war going in order to score a touchdown. Um, the Kissinger wants to settle because of his personal vanity and Al Haig is presented as a tormented moralist. It is Hollywood at its absolute worst. And, and that's all I can say about this particular one as a, is, is that it's the type of presentation people received of the, the end of the war um, in 1995. Um, Saigon clearly resisted the move toward a peace settlement in October. Um, Arvin military success had um, uh, encouraged uh, uh, two in his belief that uh, the South Vietnamese would prevail. Two was of course not consulted on the American terms uh, of settlement. Um, two also opposed any North Vietnamese presence in the South. Um, Kissinger uh, would during the negotiations express enormous annoyance with the South Vietnamese frequently. Um, later in his memoirs and subsequent writings, he would finally write that Du's, Du's own domestic imperatives imposed intransigence in a sense that he recognized that uh, President Du understood that the nature of the settlement that the Americans were thinking of would undermine and uh, ultimately destroy uh, his government. Now, Nixon's actions here are interesting. Nixon allowed Kissinger to go to Paris for another um, round of negotiations in September of 1972. Um, he and Kissinger were quite pessimistic about South Vietnamese survival. There's a famous conversation that has been used in the tapes and was used in the Ken Burns documentary of the two of them discussing South Vietnam. Um, 
And uh, Nixon emphasizes, we also have to realize, Henry, that winning an election is terribly important. It's terribly important this year. And Kissinger agreed in response to Nixon's question about whether the US could have a viable foreign policy if North Vietnam conquered South Vietnam in a year or two. Kissinger added that if we could get the proper settlement by October, by January 74, no one will give a damn. Um, and this conversation is often seen as an example of the concept of a decent interval, the idea that that's what the Nixon administration sought was a decent amount of time before the um, uh, fall or the collapse of the South Vietnamese so that the political blame would not come on Nixon. Uh, but Nixon did receive conflicting political advice from his pollsters about whether to push for a settlement before or after the election. Um, and he, in typical fashion, pursued both ends. Um, he stressed to the Soviets that he had, he had made a final offer um, and that the United States um, was determined in that sense um, to, uh, that Kissinger, and, and here Nixon um, stressed to Soviet Foreign Minister Romiko, that when Kissinger went back to the talks in October of 1972, Kissinger would be carrying our final proposal, the ultimate, the last offer we could make. If the other side said no, then the negotiation track was closed. Nixon's major worries were political. He was concerned that Kissinger's repeated trips to Paris raised hopes for peace. Um, and this was a fear that he could raise the hopes for peace and that they would be disappointed and that might hurt his electoral chances. He also worried that any type of public confrontation with two would hurt him as well. Um, but he recognized the political advantages of a peace settlement before the election, and particularly of being able to announce that the POWs would be back home by Christmas. Um, and uh, he stressed to Kissinger, if he could get a settlement, we could cram it down two's throat. And he agreed to send a letter to two, which urged the Vietnamese leader to take every measure to divorce, and, and here I quote, to avoid the development of an atmosphere which could lead to events similar to those we abhorred in 63, in which I personally opposed so vehemently in 68. Both references tapped into fears and suspicions which two harbored about the Americans. In 1968, two feared Johnson was plotting to overthrow him if he didn't agree to go to Paris for the peace talks. Even worse, I think, was the reference to the Ziem assassination of 1963 as a threat to two. Uh, in that sense, um, it's really quite extraordinary, the letter in, in, in laying out this uh, situation for uh, Nick, uh, for two. Um, the October 8th agreement, uh, Kissinger wrote extensively about um, in his memoirs. In fact, he commented that it was the moment that moved me most deeply in his career in public service. Um, effectively, Lee Ducto made concessions Nixon had demanded in May, namely the return of American POWs. Uh, the establishment of a supervised ceasefire and the end of U.S. bombing and a hard timetable for American withdrawal. Um, and Kissinger uh, felt after Lee Ducto accepted these that, and he told Winston Lord, one of his aides, we've done it. Um, John Negroponte, of course, who was far more skeptical, recognized right away that this would be a tough sell with two. Um, back at the White House, Kissinger told Dixon, the piece we are getting out of this is honor. Henry, let me tell you this, it has to be with honor, but also has to be in terms of getting out. We cannot continue to have this cancer eating at us at home, eating at us abroad. Let me say, if these bastards, the North Vietnamese, turn on us, they don't care. I'm not going to allow the United States to be destroyed by this thing. So Kissinger, Nixon was, was quite determined. Um, and I think throughout this actually also tends to blame more the North Vietnamese than the South Vietnamese, whereas Kissinger tended to blame the South Vietnamese more for resistance to the settlement than Nixon did. Um, Nixon is also famous for saying this about two. Let me come down to the nut cutting. Look at two. What Henry has read to me, two cannot turn down. If he does, our problem will be that we have to flush it. We have flushed South Vietnam. Now, how the hell are we going to come up uh, on that? So Nixon was determined to get the settlement, um, wanting to cram it down uh, the South Vietnamese, but at the same time worried about what that reaction would be. So he sends Kissinger to Saigon, and I have found this old uh, picture uh, because, of course, of, um, in part because it does uh, bring, uh, um, uh, when Kissinger went to Saigon, uh, one of the leading Vietnamese newspapers ran the Harvard Lampoon's fake naked picture of the national security advisor uh, posed on a rug as the magazine Playgirl had posed the, the actor Burt Reynolds with the caption, Kissinger has no more secrets. And this was, in a way, a reference to the fact that when he went to Saigon, uh, 
uh, the, the South Vietnamese uh, were very suspicious of the type of agreement he was bringing. Um, and uh, two um, uh, really treated Kissinger with a fair amount of contempt, uh, canceling meetings, um, arriving late, um, and leading Kissinger at one point to exclaim, I am the special envoy of the president of the United States. You know I could not be treated as an errand boy. Um, at the same time, of course, President Nixon was um, adopting proper Operation Enhance Plus, the idea of, of basically providing a great deal of military equipment and others to the South Vietnamese. But uh, the uh, situation was such that Tu was still deeply determined to resist the agreement. Uh, Kissinger told Nixon that it was hard to exaggerate, quote, the toughness of Tu's positions. His demands verge on insanity. Uh, Kissinger still wanted to keep up the schedule that he had given to Lee Duck To that would have allowed him to go to Hanoi to get the final deal and to have all of this done before the election. But Nixon now thought that if they tried to do the schedule, it would look like they had neglected their ally and that it would be, as Nixon put it, complete surrender. The president wanted him to continue to press too um, and did indeed write another letter <coughs> bringing that out. Um, but Kissinger's last meeting with Tu went as badly as his first. Tu refused to accept the continued presence of North Vietnamese army in the South and rejected uh, the uh, Council of National Reconciliation and accused the United States of wanting to abandon South Vietnam. Kissinger angrily responded that, and I think you capture something, this, this quote captures something of Kissinger's views, we have fought for four years, have mortgaged our whole foreign policy to the defense of one country. What you have said is a very bitter thing to hear. Uh, Kissinger now came back to the United States and was dealing, there was a fair amount of tension between Kissinger and Al Haig, who was Kiss, uh, Nixon, heading up Nixon's chief of staff then. And Kiss, uh, Kissinger uh, was uh, concerned that Haig was uh, being very negative about the peace settlement. And in the course of coming back in October, um, Kissinger um, actually on his own uh, decided to have a press conference where he would illuminate the fact that the peace settlement was now very close. And on in a press conference on October 26, 1972, that was extensively covered by the media, Nick Kissinger announced um, in words that uh, became rather famous, the concept that peace is at hand and that uh, the agreement is now very close to being uh, accorded. Um, uh, that night, um, uh, and the coverage of this uh, came out, uh, Nixon called up uh, 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 Kissinger. Hello. Hello, Mr. President. Well, Henry, I understand that the uh... All the three news shows were about Vietnam, and I wonder why. <laughs> uh, Colson calls me, and he thinks that we've wiped McGovern out now. Did he really? Yeah. Yeah. I just thought you'd be interested. I was in West Virginia and uh, uh, Kentucky, and I played it even a little more low key than we talked. You know, I just mentioned. I just said that. I said that uh, based on the progress that has been made to date, I can say with confidence tonight that uh, I believe we will achieve, achieve our goals, you know, yeah. just like that. Uh, what, what was the response? But the cut, they practically take the roof off. Uh, a, a peace with honor and not a, not, not a surrender. That's all, I, that's all I said. Not another day. And then I lay out the three things. Yeah. That is that, uh, that we, I said, I said we, have, we have laid down only three things. One, that all of our prisoners of war. Two, a ceasefire. I don't even say what kind. And three, that uh, the people of South Vietnam will determine their future without having it opposed. But it's North Vietnamese completely now because we're getting the credit or you're getting the credit at home for settling it while they don't get the benefit of an agreement. <laughs> and, they, uh, and you don't think, uh, I suppose the problem we've got, uh, which we have to bear in mind, is that it's just a week early. But uh, not on the. Uh, Kissinger's comment that you're getting the credit, even when it's not actually happening, is, is I think, quite striking. And it's this notion that this was going to contribute to the enormous um, uh, uh, landslide 
that was now being set in motion for the Nixon presidency. Um, Nixon, the time men of the year would come out at this point. This was when time still called it men of the year, not person of the year. And it went to Nixon and Kissinger, which of course deeply irritated Nixon, who thought he should be getting the credit uh, for this. Um, but it also brought a landslide victory and 60% of the vote for Nixon. Um, and um, you can hear Nixon, some of Nixon's reaction here, um, which is rather interesting. What's also interesting in this, besides Nixon's casual profanity, is um, Nixon's own assessment of the election and how the press would play it. Mr. President, uh, Dr. Kissinger, and also uh, Senator Humphrey, he is speaking, and it'll be a few moments where we can get him. Yeah. I have Dr. Kissinger. Hello. Dr. Kissinger, go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. President. Well, Henry, how are you? I just wanted to extend my really Woman's congratulations. Well, this is we all knew it. all knew it was going to happen, and uh, well, we, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we got we got our uh, we got our sixty percent. Well, we didn't. Uh, one couldn't really be sure yeah. until one had seen that. And every state except Massachusetts and maybe Minnesota, although I think we get that too. It's a, an extraordinary tribute. You know, this uh, this fellow to the last was a prick. Did you oh, see his concession statement? Oh. And it out. He was very gracious at the beginning. And then he went right back to yeah, that, saying that... Yeah. Uh, and Ray Price just sent me in a wire saying that I look forward to working with you and your supporters for peace in the years ahead. And I just said, hell no, I'm not going to send him that sort of a wire. Absolutely. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Not. And I uh, just argued with Bobby here about it, but I said, Ray just doesn't have the right sense of this sort of thing. No, that he was ungenerous. He yeah. was petulant. Yeah. Unworthy. Right. He was, As you probably know, I responded in a, in a very decent way to it. Well, I thought you were a great thing. As far as I could go, though, but I'm not going to say much time. I'm, well, anyway, it was a good day. We had a terrible time in the damn Senate. We're going to end up with probably 44, but it isn't worth a damn anyway. Frankly, uh, it was a pity because we lost some people. We, never, well, we lost Margaret Smith, but she's 74 years old. We lost Jack Miller because he's a jackass. That's right. And we lost uh, Caleb Boggs because he's too old. He's six, 68. Yeah. See, there's your problem. So with those three, we would have come much closer. Yeah. Well, it's all right. It's all right. But at any rate, it's a we work with this person of triumph, Mr. President. If well, you know something, it's hard for even the, the, all these left-wing columnists can do now is to piss on the not winning the Senate and the House and building the party, but they couldn't care less about that. The main thing is they know that we came up to bat against their candidate and beat the hell out of them. And came up against their issue and turned it into an action. Right. Don't you think so? Don't you feel that? You made Vietnam your issue? It's, uh, it's, it's intriguing to hear that. I, I confess that hearing them discuss people as the, the age of 68 and 74 is too old um, is a interesting and remarkable concept um, these days. Um, but the concern of the Senate, the fear of, of what would happen, and it was purely a personal triumph for Nixon. He was not able to bring in his party, which of course would cost him in the Watergate investigation. Had the Republicans won the Senate or House, uh, that investigation never would have taken the shape it did. Um, and so this, of course, is, it was, was quite important. Um, but it also affected Nixon's perception of whether he could continue the war. And I think Nixon's own concern to, to get the war done with would affect then concerns over the next uh, several weeks. Um, Nixon and Kissinger um, sounded very cordial at this point, um, but Kissinger would plant the seeds of a good deal of tension with Nixon over the next couple of months. First was Kissinger's famous Oriana Falacci interview, which uh, Lubner, uh, Lubner nicely uh, mentioned in her introduction. Uh, Kissinger's discussion of himself as a cowboy and of doing things alone and of taking credit for the China uh, initiative deeply, deeply incensed Nixon. Um, the, I don't have the tape of the recording of his conversation on this with Halderman, but boy, was he annoyed with Kissinger's uh, approach. And this, uh, this started a situation in which there were all sorts of, of, of suspicions now. Um, and Nixon did occasionally now say that he would fire Kissinger, um, that he would get rid of Kissinger after the agreement was made. Um, Kissinger was a, a, 
Kissinger went back to Paris to continue negotiations with the North Vietnamese, taking the 69 changes that uh, President Tu wanted, um, although he did so very unenthusiastically. Um, but Nixon now feared a Congress, and Nixon also feared that Congress would cut off support for the war, but he also feared um, having to make a bilateral agreement with North Vietnam that excluded Saigon. So he didn't want either of those political alternatives uh, to take place. And there were a great deal of frustration during uh, November of 1972. Uh, Kissinger and Le Docteau were at an impasse again. Uh, and Kissinger warned Nixon, as he said, we'll have to face a breakdown in the talks and the need for a drastic step up in our bombing of the North, accompanied by a review of our negotiating strategy. Nixon responds in November of 1972, resumption of heavy bombing in the North is probably not a viable option for us. And here one does get into the fact that Nixon and Kissinger went back and forth about the type of, of response they thought. And Nixon, as often as he expressed the, his frustration with the North, also thought that he was restricted and being able to do anything militarily about it. Nixon then did say, I would be prepared to authorize a massive strike on the North in the interval before the talks are resumed. I recognize this is a high risk option, but it's one I'm prepared to take if the only alternative is an agreement worse than October 8th. In some, take a hard line with Saigon, an equally hard line with Hanoi. This is his instructions to Kissinger. We cannot make a bad deal simply because of the fact that the massive expectations which have been built up in this country for a settlement would lead to an equally massive letdown if bombing were resumed. We owe it to the sacrifice that has been made, uh, even though the cost in our public support will be massive. Nixon and Kissinger went back and forth. Hanoi withdrew some of its concessions. There was a fear that Hanoi was playing for time with expectations that Congress would cut off funding for two. The famous meeting of December 14th with uh, Kissinger says in his memoirs, there's no record for it. There is a tape record of now. Um, and it's fascinating listing. Uh, both of them were facing us down in a position of, uh, the US is caught between Hanoi and Saigon, Kissinger tells Nixon, um, in which Hanoi is just stringing us along and Saigon is just ignoring us. Kissinger, um, would get very angry about this. In fact, uh, would refer to the North Vietnamese in the strongest possible of terms. Um, uh, Kissinger uh, became convinced they're always going to keep it just out of our reach without a deadline like election day of November 7th. Uh, and Kissinger defended his push to get an agreement. The North Vietnamese was reverted to their normal negotiating habit of delay after delay. Their shits, Kissinger exclaimed, tawdry, miserable, filthy people. They make the Russians look good. Kissinger also made a comparison here to the EC-121 incident and told Nixon that if you don't do something about what the North Vietnamese are doing now, you'll really be impotent. Um, and in this case, uh, Kissinger's uh, approach and Nixon, the, the meeting of, Jan of December 14th would lead then to the Christmas bombing. Um, almost immediately, of course, as a result of that, the media coverage attacked uh, uh, Nick's, or Kissinger's pieces at hand uh, statement that the war was, of course, continuing. The Christmas bombing, which went from December 18th, 1972, with a lull only over Christmas to December 28th, 1972, was an enormous uh, 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 bombing campaign against the North, um, but did inflict uh, considerable damage. There was a world outcry against the resumption of hostilities by Nixon. Nixon would drop some 10 points in popularity. Kissinger would be compared by some of his favorite newspaper columnists to being a good German, referencing the Nazi past. Olaf Palma would compare the US action to Nazi bombing. The Pope would object as an object of our daily grief. Um, Senator Saxby of Ohio would question Nixon's sanity. Um, Kissinger during this period, and it's a fascinating uh, also uh, glimpse into his uh, psychology, would separate himself from Nixon and would give a number of interviews in which he suggested that he had opposed the bombing. Um, it was something, uh, Kissinger uses the expression, it's something about in my career that I'm not proud of. He uses that for talking about the wiretapping of journalists, but he also uses it to talk about his attempt to uh, basically blade the blame of the bombing on Nixon when he in fact had um, also uh, supported it. Um, what Kissinger had actually urged Nixon to do was also go public with it and Kiss uh, Nixon had refused. 
Nixon did not make a public statement on the Christmas bombing. He did not make a speech on it. He simply undertook it um, without any public announcement. Um, the bombing worked. And this is, in, in some sense, um, the Christmas bombing, as it came to be called, um, it actually was effective in uh, bringing the North Vietnamese back to the negotiating table. Um, it did not, uh, it's not a justification or rationalization of the level of force or civilian casualties or the loss of B-52s, uh, but it did convince the North Vietnamese to basically give Nixon a chance to get out of Vietnam. In effect, as uh, Negroponte, John Negroponte would later put it, um, to allow the North Vietnamese to accept our concessions. Um, and uh, it also would allow, as China had, and Soviet Union had been advising North Vietnam to let the Americans leave. Um, and uh, there were some minor adjustments in the agreement between October and uh, January, but they were very, very minor. It was basically the same agreement that had been struck on October 8th. Nixon did send a series of communications and letters to assure President Tu of a military response to North Vietnamese violations of the agreement. And in effect, this was a case of bombing, both of, of the bombing being designed to convince both North Vietnam and South Vietnam uh, of the need to settle. And uh, it would um, continue to pressure, the pressure would be continued on to during this time. Um, this is a picture of, of Kissinger and Le Duc Tho at the signing. The Paris Peace Accords did, of course, still allow North Vietnamese troops to remain in the South. Um, Nick, uh, Kissinger would defend this at the press conference that was held on January 24th by talking about the fact that they could not be resupplied or replenished, but of course, never mentioned the fact that indeed um, the, uh, there were no enforcement mechanisms for any of that uh, type of control of the North Vietnamese presence in the South. U.S. troops would be completely withdrawn. There would be no residual force, which I think was probably one of the absolutely key factors uh, in the nature of the agreement. American prisoners of war were returned, and this was sort of central, that the POWs would not have been returned if the United States had insisted on a residual force. Uh, President Tu would remain in power, and Nixon did give him these secret assurances. Kissinger did not mention these when he talked of the agreement. Um, in front of the public in January of 1973. Now, Kissinger at one point was asked about whether there was a decent interval. Um, and um, I like showing this. I, I hope it will come up here. Uh, okay. And this was Kissinger. In 2010, the State Department had an event in which Henry Kissinger was invited for the final publication of the Vietnam documents. Thank you very much. I must point out that uh, I hold one record that will be hard to exceed. That there are a number of questions between now and uh, close to 11 o'clock. We have two uh, gentlemen from the historian's office who are going to be holding the microphones, working from uh, both sides. Raise your hand if you uh, would like to ask a question, and uh, uh, upon payment of $50, they'll be glad to come to, to uh, let you answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kissinger, I'd like to ask you about what's known in the historian's field as the decent interval strategy, namely the argument that the administration's policy was premised on the idea that a withdrawal of the United States uh, should be accomplished and that it, there should be a decent interval between then and the prospect of a communist takeover in the South. And I know you know some of the materials on this. I wondered if you give your perspective as to whether uh, you uh, thought South Vietnam could sustain an existence as a viable state. Well, uh, first of all, as historians, what you should do when you see statements <clears throat> it's to ask yourself about the context in which they were made. And you will find that all the statements that are sort of twisted into decent interval uh, statements were made to the other side. Uh, 
almost all of them. And what they were attempting to say was, we are willing to have a political contest. And we are willing to... Kissinger went on to say that, of course, we knew that the North Vietnam might last, or it might not last. Um, uh, and, uh, but his initial statement that we made only these decent interval comments to the other side, which they did to Chinese and Soviets, basically allow the United States to surrender uh, or allow the United States to get out with dignity and then the political solution can, can occur in Vietnam. Um, they also made them internally. They talked internally about the need for an interval if that were to happen. Um, but his, his point, and he would go on in this particular moment when I got the chance to ask him this question, he would go on to say, in fact, um, that uh, we didn't think South Vietnam would survive, uh, or we didn't, we didn't know whether South Vietnam would survive that long, but we, we had some hope that it might. Um, and I would argue, in fact, that Watergate and Nixon's collapse is, of course, crucial here, that Nixon's political demise really did set in, into uh, force a, a situation in which he would be incapable of having launched any sort of military response to um, a North Vietnamese violation similar to what occurred in 1975. Nixon's resignation was there, the fall of Saigon. And here I want to close um, my talk um, on the Korea and Vietnam connection again. Um, the U.S. did not leave troops in Vietnam in contrast with Korea. Even a small active presence of, North, of American troops in South Vietnam would have served as a tripwire, what was a, a famously used term describing American soldiers both in Europe and in Korea. But otherwise, North Vietnam would not have agreed to the return of the POWs, and the return of the POWs was central to American public opinion. In this sense, the Nixon administration was hoist on its own petard. It had made the POW such a central issue in the continuation of the war that it could not, in effect, have ended the war any other way that did not secure the return of the POWs. In that sense, by uh, creating a situation in which there was no residual force that might have acted as a deterrent, um, South Vietnam was in a, a very difficult situation um, especially after Nixon's political support in the country collapsed um, and uh, the possibility of any type of American military response to uh, the type of violation North Vietnam committed uh, was impossible. And I want to here bring in a, a counterfactual. And this connects to uh, my own research interest in tying the Vietnam and Korean Wars together as both historically necessary to understanding, but also seeing their relationship between the two. Uh, President Carter, when he came in in 1976, wanted to withdraw all U.S. troops from Korea. He would ultimately be frustrated by the Pentagon and other parts of the national security bureaucracy. Uh, we do not use the term deep state, but the Carter's was really quite determined. He wanted to end the American military commitment um, to Korea. Uh, the Korean government of Park Chung-hee at the time was a repressive dictatorship. Um, it had run afoul of uh, issues on human rights. Uh, it had been involved in scandals involving payments uh, called Korea Gate in Washington. Uh, its human rights record had encouraged congressional crit criticism. I think an interesting counterfactual is had the US withdrawn from Korea when Carter came into office, would South Korea have faced the possibility of a North Korean military action similar to what North Vietnam did in 75? In a way, the uh, the domestic politics of the United States changed drastically between the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and those domestic politics would ultimately compel American withdrawal from South Vietnam and might have worked in that manner with Korea um, had, uh, in, in fact, political climate not changed again at the end of the 70s with uh, Carter's reversal after the Afghanistan invasion and then Ronald Reagan's election. So it's, uh, I think, an interesting connection between Korea and Vietnam. And uh, in fact, of course, early in the uh, 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 decisions to escalate in Vietnam, many of the analogies were to Korea, the uh, resistance to any invasion of North Vietnam, the uh, insistence on trying to make sure that the Chinese did not intervene by uh, secret agreements, all of this. So I do think there is this connection between Vietnam and Korea that this conference has highlighted in other ways um, and uh, does highlight, gets highlighted in this, in the uh, 
uh, nature of the American support for uh, the type of foreign policy conducted in East Asia and how that changed over that 20 year period. But I'd only like to conclude now for and ask for questions because of this um, issue and uh, recognize that I think in the end, the United States um, uh, policy on the Paris Peace Conference ultimately did come from a calculation of its political effect in the United States and that that was central uh, to the decisions made in 1973. So I'll close there. Uh, thanks, Tom. That was really uh, engrossing. And the point that you make, I think, about the importance of domestic politics is really well taken and the, uh, the television footage that turns out quite nicely. Um, I was wondering what you made, uh, when we think about the kind of broader uh, period of U.S. troop withdrawal from 69 to uh, essentially 73, I suppose, early 73, um, how would you assess the balance between Kissinger and Nixon on one hand and the U.S. Congress on the other hand? Do you think that um, Kissinger and Nixon were really in control of the timing of events or um, was it more Congress? I, I, I'm just curious what you think the, the balance of the relationship between the two is. Well, I think here I'm going to bring in a name that hasn't been mentioned and probably should be more often, and that's Melvin Laird. Yes, <laughs> yes. and that's... Uh, and, and, and I do, I, I give him credit in the book and I don't, I, I really do feel like this is one of those areas where, you know, at some point it could be reassessed very completely. Melvin Laird had a deep understanding of the domestic politics of foreign policy and, and his, his role in both pushing withdrawals and also timing leaks and making sure that this information got out was a continual source of frustration to Kissinger and Nixon, particularly Kissinger, who I think did for much of the period of the withdrawals, um, hold on to this hope that at some point the North Vietnamese might be willing to negotiate a settlement with him, and that he felt he was continually undermined by the withdrawals. Now, this didn't mean that he didn't think that the United States needed to get out of Vietnam. I think he did think that, but he wanted to do it in a negotiated manner, and in, in that sense, uh, both for po political credit for himself, but also he believed that this would be the best solution for the country that simple withdrawal. Um, but Mel Laird, who, who recognized Congress wanted out and wanted some, some type of a fig leaf here in the Vietnamization, I think was, was determined to accelerate the process. Um, and I think largely dictated most of the timing um, outside of, of the fact that he couldn't um, completely do it. So I would probably give Laird more credit here um, in, in following that direction um, than uh, either Kissinger or Nixon in that, and that both uh, men um, were trying for different reasons to hold on to a, a, a situation that might allow for a negotiated settlement. I just wanted, I don't know whether you or anyone here might be able to answer, but I've always wondered if geography didn't play a role in the fact that Korea survived and Vietnam didn't, since it was a peninsula, you couldn't have a Ho Chi Minh uh, road. I think, well, that, that also explains the strategy of the Ho Chi Minh Road. You, you know, the idea that, for example, you don't observe, a, you, geography was key, but also was the North Vietnamese willing just to see Indochina as one battlefield and not believe that because the demilitarized zone was there, that that was the only place they could send forces across, uh, similar to the way the North Koreans had sent forces across in the 38th parallel. And so the fact that they built the Ho Chi Minh Trail and that they essentially use Laos and Cambodia as part of the uh, battlefield, uh, both for sanctuaries originally and then later as, as combat areas, it did provide that. I think geography is important here, but also it's the politics. It's understanding that um, what the North Koreans had done, and this is part of the reason I do think that there's an interesting book here. I'm not sure if I'm going to write it. I'm hoping to at some point, but they're interesting in, in the sense that they recognize what the North Koreans have done wrong um, in terms of the direct military assault across uh, what was seen as a boundary uh, established, even if it was temporary. And that, so they adopted a strategy that involved um, a use of, of, of uh, roads and, and methods that didn't, didn't highlight that and that allowed them to support forces in, in, in ways and was less politically um, uh, subject to uh, sort of an international law view that they violated that boundary or something like that. They could then control the insurgency in the South and it could appear as a genuine uh, 
insurgency as compared to directed by the North in a way that the North Koreans couldn't. Now, this doesn't stop the North Koreans from believing that the South was still vulnerable. And, and certainly one of the things we know now is that North Korea did maintain a fairly aggressive policy uh, into 1968 with the raid on the presidential palace and other activities. And so what I, I think one of the great mysteries to me of thinking about this is I think I have an idea of what North Vietnam believe they learned from Korea, but not of what the North Koreans believe they might have learned and what, what they might have been uh, seeking to do. Um, some of this goes back to a conversation I had with a North Vietnamese historian um, at a conference in 2000 conducted by the Cold War International History Project. I posed the question to him, why was there such a determination to end the war in 1972 through massive military action, um, which of course was extraordinarily costly in, in lives for the North Vietnamese, when it was clear the Americans were going, and they, could, they could take a more gradualist policy. And one of his responses was, we feared ending up like North Korea, namely isolated and not, uh, that, that in effect, the fear was that if they did not accomplish the conquest of the South more quickly and more decisively, they would never get it. That the, the Korean example was one they looked at as, this is not where we want to go. We don't want to be in a situation of permanent division. We want to achieve um, a, a, a reunification as quickly and decisively as possible, despite the costs. Now, I, I think at some point, uh, there's a part of me that hopes that Vietnam becomes uh, open enough to have a debate about the relative costs that were exacted by Li Zhuang's policies and the rest that were undertaken. But I'm not holding my breath for that. But I, I think that would be a, a good point. But I do think there was a way in which they looked at the two. That's one of the things that I think is one of the genius elements of this conference, of tying the two together. And I'd love to see more attempts to do that. The sources are are difficult on some of these le some levels, uh, but but still would be fascinating to try to tie the two conflicts together in terms of how each nation also saw them, as well as how the United States saw the two as interrelated. Yeah, I mean, it's always amazing how many uh, casualties North Vietnam was willing to take, because I mean, you talk about the Tet Offensive from the point of view of the US, that was a massive defeat for the North Vietnamese. They lost so many, and they just kept, they kept sending in troops and they kept having these massive losses, and it's just crazy military policy. Well, but it, it was directed by this sense that reunification was the utmost national priority of the of the Politburo, and particularly Li Zhuang. And, and in a way, um, and, and Sean might want to uh, interject on this, but ultimately there was this view in North Vietnam that the state was far more viable if it controlled the South, that South was wealthy and more prosperous, and that the the and and the, and less politically stable and more fragmented and subject to to this, and that the conquest of the South would be essential to Vietnam's viability as a state. And to a certain extent, they were correct on that. That Vietnam, as a viable nation state, uh, was much more uh, uh, um, much stronger as a unified nation. The ironic thing is, of course, Korea, despite division, South Korea has emerged as this extraordinary. Um, success story, and North Korea has been something of a failure uh, compared, but the, that doesn't mean that the North Koreans don't recognize uh, that, that there's not some of this sort of recognition of, of the mistaken policies taken toward reunification. So I, th I, th I think this is an interesting counterfactual and interesting area of history to explore, and that's, uh, I think, one thing that this conference could, could uh, stimulate. Well, I mean, uh, it was reversed in Korea, too, because it was the North originally that was more prosperous. Right. And the South that was poor, yeah. um, which probably also plays a role. Which plays a role and plays, you know, until, until the, the, this is why even in 1968, when the Korean um, economy was already beginning to, uh, the South Korean economy was beginning to grow, the North, Viet North Korean uh, actions here are fascinating to me as to what extent um, they uh, did think about restarting the war. It certainly was a concern of the Americans in viewing the impact of the Tet Offensive to think that if there is another war breaks out in Korea, we can't, we can't handle this. Uh, we're we're overcommitted in Vietnam. This was one of the reasons why they urged on Johnson the de-escalation policy in March of 68. So there is a way in which these are also connected. 
Um, it will be probably a long time before we get into any North Korean files to really discover um, how they were actually calculating this and whether, uh, whether there, there was a hope of reigniting the Korean conflict as a way of uh, spurring possible reunification as late as 1969 um, uh, with the shooting down even of the EC-121 and happened at the beginning of the Nixon administration. So um, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by the links. Um, the Cold War project may allow some of this to be explored more fully, uh, but I think there's even links in, in the Paris peace settlement um, in terms of how both South Korea and North Korea then saw what happened and then the fall of Saigon and what happened after that. Um, before I take any more questions to our physical audience, we have a virtual question from Japan. Oh. Um, Korea Vietnam connection. When I was watching the U.S. withdrawal withdrawal from Kabul, I was surprised to think that in fact the U.S. after World War II has rarely been victorious in battlefields. The U.S. and Korea ended in a stalemate. Vietnam was a long quagmire ending in withdrawal. So are Iraq and Afghanistan. Rare victories besides the Gulf War are in Dominica and Grenada. How do you think? Well, I think this is a this, this is one of the issues. I, I think yesterday it was raised this issue of limited war and how limited war came to be part of the post 1945 scenario. And the United States did adopt this uh, politically because of the presence of nuclear weapons that wars would have to be limited and that it could not uh, go all out or fight with, with all of its weapons. And so in effect, what the questioner is getting at is the fact that the United States has um, uh, been limited conventionally. And while it was able, for example, to show conventional superiority, for example, in the first Gulf War, and then in the beginning of the Iraq War, it, its ability to handle limited insurgencies and guerrilla war has always been much more suspect. Um, and this goes back in American history, one could look at some of the quote unquote banana wars in Latin America in the 1920s and um, other, uh, even the Philippines war um, was a very, very messy, um, and un, uh, although quote unquote successful, still very uh, uh, disturbingly costly uh, victories. So, I think the caller is not wrong to say that the United States military has a very has a mixed record. Part of that is uh, because of the politics of the wars that it has fought have been restrictive about some types of use of military force and also have um, ineffectively understood the nature of nation building as a concept and the ability to actually um, uh, uh, create stability through the use of military force and occupation, something that the United States has learned uh, really quite uh, uh, to, its, to, to its dismay. One, another reason for an interest I have in the Korea-Vietnam connection would be to ask the question of whether the United States did something right in South Korea that it got wrong in South Vietnam. I'm not sure if that's the case, but for example, one episode that I, I have researched but not written about, and I still think is fascinating, is that in 1963, when the United States was faced with the turmoil over the South Vietnamese government um, of No Din Diem, it was also faced with turmoil in South Korea over Park Chung Hee's implementation of, of uh, martial law. And the ambassador there, eventually the United States uh, effectively used political pressure to force Park to actually have a reasonably fair election that he won in, in late 1963 um, and stabilized. Now Park went on to become a dictator, but um, at the same time as the United States sponsored a coup in South Vietnam, it sponsored an effective election in South Korea that actually turned out relatively fair for the, for the time being. And, led to um, some political stability in Korea for a period of time. So it's, again, one of these issues of, of, of the comparison between the two, uh, two nations that might um, uncover or allow us to make some interesting conclusions about America's role in East Asia. So I just wanted to, if I could just add something. I think the fact that none of those wars were declared officially by Congress, I suppose the last war that was officially declared was World War II shows that from the start, there was uh, some uh, lack of support. But that, that you know, the, you, could, you could apply that episode to the Persian Gulf War. Persian Gulf War was deeply divisive. The Senate only voted by a few votes to go in to allow Bush to go in. And Bush said he didn't need that authority. 
and had the war, the war was won decisively in 28 days. I mean, one of the keys is just how quickly the war could be over. And if you get it over quickly, Congress, it doesn't matter. And ultimately, I don't think declaration of wars matter anymore. It really comes down to um, whether uh, the, the strategy is such to allow the United States to achieve its objectives in a reasonable amount of time before popular opposition um, mounts, as it did even in Korea. And this came out in, in uh, Mitch's talk yesterday that within a year, um, you know, the public opinion had soured in that. And I think any long scale US military engagement faces that problem. Um, I would like to ask a question, if I may get off topic, because your book is a life story of Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read Neil Ferguson's uh, first volume of his multi volume biography of Kissinger, but he praises him as an intellectual and a thinker. Mm -hmm. So suppose you're on the hiring committee of the Department of Government of Harvard University in the 1950s. Would you have voted to give Henry Kissinger tenure? Love to. That's that's one of those questions. Uh, you know, having had been in that position, I'm I'm a softie on tenure. I have to say, I'm uh, I'm generally if the book's out, you know, no problem. You know, I'm I'm generally there. I mean, uh, if the guy could teach, and Kissinger could teach, and he, you know, he um uh, he got a book out. Um, his problem was, and, and there's this old uh, the old stories at Harvard that he was in the government department, but declared himself to be a historian. And I think if political scientists were always a little bit divided on that uh, in terms of how he went about it, and historians always tended to see him as not very historical because he didn't do research as historians do. He, he worked with published materials and he, he worked at a sort of higher level on that. Um, Kissinger, uh, you know, thought he should have gotten tenure um, early on. Um, he would eventually be brought back to Harvard after his bestsellers, but he left Harvard uh, effectively and almost ended up at the University of Chicago. Um, in fact, accepted a job at the University of Chicago only to turn it down after Harvard came uh, back to him, um, much to the regret of Senator Charles Percy, who was a big uh, uh, backer of, of uh, Kissinger and wanted him to come to Chicago. So Kissinger was always um, angling on that. I, I think I would have voted for tenure simply because um, his work, I think, on the uh, as a political science treatise, is I think actually quite insightful about the nature of peacemaking. Even though some of the history is a bit elided, um, I still think he has some interesting principles on that. Uh, but um, I, I confess, uh, um, I have heard a lot at Harvard about him, um, and I mentioned I actually tell the story in my book of the first time I went to. Uh, once I got uh, the beginning of the contract and had dinner with a group of Harvard professors from that era who were still there um, and who told me I should entitle the book President of the Destruction, that Kissinger destroyed more than he achieved. And the resentment of Henry Kissinger at Harvard was quite intense. Um, we have one minute left. Can anyone make a really quick comment or question, Sean? Yeah, yeah just very quickly. I'm wondering, presumably you spent a lot of time studying Kissinger in a foreign policy context, but I'm wondering, is there anything about the process of writing more biographical work that changed how you assess him in a foreign policy context? Great question, Sean. And let me let me think if I can. Um, I, think, I think it was recognizing um, his political sensibility um, and the degree to which he uh, sort of uh, and the political sensibility and media sensibility, his understanding of, of human relations was always so much greater, of course, certainly than Nixon's and his, uh, his charm, which is, cannot be underestimated. He's an extraordinarily charming person. You may dislike him, but he, you know, even in my own brief encounters with him, he's extraordinarily charming. And his charm and ability to deal with journalists, many of whom deeply disliked the policies that they thought his president was pursuing, it is extraordinary. So I, I came to admire his personal uh, ability to also to, to also basically to be able to walk a fine line between telling the truth and telling a lie, which uh, Kissinger can be caught in lies, but it's very uh, relatively rare because it's often he's often on a very it, it, you, you have to parse his words very carefully. Um, and he did develop that technique and um, in, a, in a different context, in a different political system, he may well have become a sort of president of the United States of some type of thing. I mean, his, 
He was excluded from that by his birth, but there were people who wanted to amend the constitution to allow him uh, to become president. But it, I think that, that uh, he had a, a great deal of political skill too. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, Alex Tai, who's a doctor in history. Um, and he's subject matter expert at the U.S. Department of Defense, POW, MIA Accounting Agency. Um, he has a book coming out soon, uh, Towards a Framework on Vietnamese American History. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about a very important subject, uh, Big Brothers, the Soviet Union, and China's influences in the Vietnam War. Thank you, Laurie, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Luna, for organizing this thing, both of you and the whole community for, for this event. It's a great journey from all the way from Honolulu. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of changed the topic a little bit, uh, but uh, the core of, of, of the talk is pretty much the same. I just felt like the title of uh, that I proposed initially was not really reflective uh, of the top with the topic. Um, but uh, earlier, we, during um, Thomas' talk, um, Laurie, you mentioned about um, how the Vietnamese continue, the North Vietnamese continue to send troops after, you know, thousands, after thousands, after Tet, after 72 and, and, and whatnot, and continue to be able to do that. Uh, I guess my talk will kind of like sort of explain why, what enabled them to do that. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll start with uh, with this uh, quote. Uh, um, the first time we, when the victorious army entered Saigon in 1975, while everyone in the army was cheering and laughing, I cried because I saw that my youth had been wasted in vain. I was not overwhelmed by the tall buildings in the south, south meaning South Vietnam, but by the works of all the southern writers that were published under the free regime. All the authors I've never known with uh, their work on display in bookstores right on the sidewalk, along with all the media experiences uh, such as TV, radio, cassette, those experiences were dreams for Northerners. This is written by, uh, this was a comment by Zung Tu Hung, the famous author of Paradise of the Blind. She's currently here in, uh, in Paris, oh uh, no, in, uh, in France. Uh, uh, she was a uh, Communist Party member, a political dis uh, dissident, a famed author um, who left Vietnam about 10 years ago. Um, so in studying modern Vietnam, the Vietnam War, the first and the second Indochina Wars, the question that has always kind of intrigued me um, is what enabled the Communist-led Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV, uh, to defeat French and uh, the French and outlast the U.S. and its ally, the South uh, South uh, Vietnam, the answer can vary as many factors um, contributed to the DOV successes. Uh, so there's no one particular answer. However, for today's talk, I would like to concentrate on three interrelated factors that I believe were fundamentally important to the DOV uh, successes. The these factors included first the development and modernization of the DRV's uh, military, uh, which is very basic. Uh, we all know that. So, and second is mass mobilization campaign to implement what is known as land reform and later collectivization. And third is the repression of the Nhân Văn Zai Phong dissident reformist intellectual movement uh, and its consequences. Essentially, it was the ability to develop a modern military force to fight and win large battles, the ability to control the overall population in ways that would enable the governing political body to mobilize the populations to serve its purpose. And lastly, the ability to control and manipulate people's voice and opinion was very important for the North to win these wars. Um, through considering these three factors, I would like us to also understand the significant role that the U.S., the Soviet Union, and the, the Chinese, the People's Republic of China, or PRC, play in providing North Vietnam with both military backing and also political template that were vital to its successes. So uh, I will go, uh, I will discuss a little bit about the, media, uh, the military, which uh, there's much on the topic of Chinese relationship with North Vietnam, especially its military influence in Vietnam during the wars, and that must be explored similar to how we explore the U.S. in relation to South Vietnam. Uh, 
Uh, for years and even until this very day, the Vietnamese government uh, continued to deny China's role in both the first and second Indochina War. Someone mentioned about this yesterday, right? They have they held commemoration about Chinese sacrifice in Vietnam, but they hide that from the public. Uh, um, gaining access to Vietnamese historical records on its relationship with China, especially archival records, is still one of the most difficult tasks for any researcher today, for it, it is somewhat censored. Nonetheless, Chinese records have proven that China play an undeniable role in Indochina and was a significant factor in the successes of the DRV, both against the French and the US. Scholars such as Chen Chen, Nicholas Ku, Chen Zai, uh, An Cheng Guan have tried to address this uh, over the years, for the past 20 years. The most in-depth exploration into the Chinese military influence in Vietnam is by uh, Xiaobing Li, uh, whose two volume recently published last year, um, concentrated on China's foundational role in building the People's, Repu uh, People's Army of Vietnam, Pevin, uh, during the First Indochina War, as well as the role of Chinese army in the Vietnam War, the Second War. Uh, so because of works like this, I'm not gonna go deep into the military factors. Hence, instead of delving deep into this aspect, I just wanted to highlight and re-emphasize here the significant role in, China, in which China played in both wars, something that the scholarship on the wars in Indochina has often neglected while concentrating mainly on the U.S. role in Vietnam, uh, thus creating a false narrative uh, in the history, historical uh, narrative of the Vietnam War that the North Vietnam was fighting these anti-colonial and anti-imperialist wars all on its own and therefore was somehow the only legitimate and truer uh, inheritor or, or representation of Vietnamese national tradition. Uh, that, however, was far from historical truth. The DOV did not win these wars simply with sheer will or bamboo sticks itself. They rely on helps from the Chinese and the Soviet Union. So the first Indochina war began in 1946. However, between 1946 and 1949, the DOV was mainly fighting a pro -act, protracted peasant guerrilla war against the French to a stalemate. They couldn't advance much uh, down. Uh, following the revolutionary success of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, and the establishment of the PRC in 1949, China became an inspiration and a model of revolutionary movement and success in Asia, and therefore had a great impact on both East and Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnam. With this success in 1949, China became a model for the DRV to look and to model after. Uh, thus, immediately in 1950, Ho Chi Minh went over to China to convey to Mao Zedong that uh, Vietnam needs China to fight the French. Immediately, Stalin, uh, immediately the DRV got official recognition from China and the Soviet Union that very month. The Soviet Union under Stalin did not have much care for Southeast Asia, to be honest, um, and, and placed that task uh, on Mao uh, and the newly established PRC. Uh, Mao, for all his ambition to enhance the PRC's global recognition and to create a buffer zone against the potential encirclement of the US, was more than ready to lend a helping hand to the DRV. Uh, Immediately following Ho's request, Mao dispatched Chinese advisor and military aid to support the Viet Minh, beginning with the formation of the Chinese Military Advisory Group, uh, CMAG, and the Chinese Political Advisory Group, CPAG. Uh, initially in 1950 to 51, under the advisory of the People's Liberation Army, the Viet Minh trained People's War, uh, trained in People's War doctrine and guerrilla war tactics. Uh, Chinese advisor introduced to the Vietnamese the Chinese model of chain command, political, political control, and organization standards. As the war escalated, the Chinese became more involved in working together with Vietnamese leaders to issue such things as battle planning, operation execution, ta tactical improvement, and battle assessment. The Chinese helped the DOV establish military units uh, artillery, uh, artillery force, uh, force, including providing technical support, uh, equipment supply, and uh, official training. Uh, 
Uh, all these were part of the three transformative uh, transformation processes to transform the uh, the, the the People's Army of uh, Vietnam's military. Uh, one, transforming the the peasant from a peasant force fighting guerrilla warfare to a regular army capable of engaging in mobile warfare. Number two, enabling the Pavan to transform from a fight from fighting small scale battles to winning large scale decisive campaign or war. And three, providing continuous military aid to North Vietnam between 1955 and 1965 to transform the Viet Minh from a People's Liberation Army to a revolutionary army into a national and professional defense force with 18 division totaling 300,000 troops. Uh, between 1954 and 1956, Chinese continued to assist the Pavan reorganization and rearmament, including training, education, logistics, technology. Chinese advisor helped Vietnamese develop army, logistics, uh, naval, uh, Navy, uh, Air Force, engineering, all these matters. Um, during the Vietnam War from 1956 to 1975 against South Vietnam the, and the U.S., China increased its ma material support for North Vietnam. In 1962, Mao provided DR, the DRV grains and weapons to supply the NLF uh, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In 1965, China began sending troops to Vietnam. Between 1965 and 1968, China sent 23 division to Vietnam, including 93 regiments totaling 320,000 troops to Vietnam. Additionally, additionally, in 1968, China sent 110,000 troops to Laos to provide air defense for um, and construct repair highways and maintain transportation and communication along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Conf confiscated wartime documents that you now can get access in the Library of Congress, for example, uh, have demonstrated the Chinese advisor and soldiers were not operating only in northern Vietnam, um, but instead were active as far as the Delta, uh, the Mekong Delta and the Central Highlands, participating in different wartime activities, including road construction, as well as helping Vietnamese record military activities and campaigns. Uh, to produce wartime propaganda films. Conclusively, it was China's colossal supply, support, and guidance, along with Soviet Union's aid, uh, that enabled the DRV to intensify and carry on the war with, uh, to, to win the war against the, the, the French, but then to carry on the, the longer war against a more costlier war against the American and the South Vietnamese uh, from 1956 all the way to 1975. However, to step back a bit, I would like to return to the first Indochina War in the 1950s to discuss two other Chinese influenced social developments that I believe were fundamental in shaping the DRV's mode of rule and therefore North Vietnam's society, which thus allows the DRV to win the war against the French and mobilize the Northern population for an even longer and costlier war against South Vietnam. These two social developments were the land reform uh, campaign and the Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm movement. So what is the land reform? Um, why was it important and but, but remains to this very day uh, one of the most sensitive and prohibited topics uh, in Vietnam? Uh, for many, land reform is a mere idea of just you know, taking and redistributing land. However, the DOV's land reform model after the Chinese experience was much more consequential and had a much more lasting effect in terms of transforming northern society, social, economic, and political relations. To win the war against the French, especially to win the battle, a major battle such as Dien Bien Phu, that decisively end French colonial rule, the DOV needed more than just military aid from China. It needed the support of the general population, specifically the support of the peasant class which represent the majority of the population at the time. The trade-off to win the support of this pro uh, is the, the promise of land to the tiller, thus land reform. Until 1950, the DOV's land policy were modest, limited to investigating conditions in rural areas and de demanding rent reduction to appease all classes, including landowners and rich peasants. Most of them were 
patriotic supporter of the revolution, to gain the support of the masses and to maintain a united national front and in the anti-colonial war against the French. Although maintaining a broad united front was, was retained all the way until 1953, the DRV land reform uh, program became more comprehensive and radical in 1950 when with the arrival of Chinese advisor and, and re relying on the Chinese model, which believed in the people's war, uh, right, and on, mo on mobilizing vast sectors of the population, namely the peasantry. In early 1950, uh, the early 1950s was, for this reason, a high point of Mao's influence in, and party authority. Before the implementation of land reform in 1951, the DOV had prepared the ground for land reform by forcing intellectuals to participate in rectification campaigns in which they must denounce their bourgeois writing that they had published before joining the party. This would be important for my next uh, section. To implement the success of the land reform, the Communist Party leadership turned to the Chinese advisor for advice. Uh, since the CCP had successfully implemented land reform in the 1930s and 1940s, the Chinese advisor provided a revolutionary model of land reform. Uh, the person over there is his name is uh, Lu Lo Quibo. In Vietnamese, it's La Quiba. The first Chinese advisor sent to Vietnam became the first. Uh, ambassador, uh, Chinese ambassador in Vietnam in 1956. Uh, in, in the fall of 1952, Lo Quibo submitted a detailed plan for land reform in Vietnam, in which he called on the Vietnamese Communist Party to remove landlords, landowners, and rich peasants through trials. About 20, so these uh, are about 20 to 34 percent of the rural population. Replace them with party cadres, reorganize rural system, and use land as a means to consolidate power for the party state. The reform would redistribute majority of the land to the poor and landless in order to win them over to the revolution. The objective was to consolidate power necessary to mobilize the peasant to support the Viet Minh's war effort for Dien Bien Phu. While, the Moscow, while in Moscow, Ho Chi Minh personally sought the blessing of Liu, Liu Shaoqi and Stalin uh, regarding Lo Quibo's blueprint for land reform in North Vietnam. Upon his return to Vietnam, Ho and the, the DRV carried out land reform in 1953. Deng Yifen, chief of the uh, political advisory group, assigned Zhang Dechen to supervise the land reform as the head of land reform and party consolidation. In spring of 1953, Beijing sent 42 additional land reform experts to Vietnam. They work with the Vietnamese uh, cadres from village to village, organizing peasant association as a new authority, train self-defense mil militia teams as law enforcement and drawing, uh, drawing a line between the rich and the poor, uh, poor as friends and foe. Then they call for a village rally to invite the poor peasants to describe their hardships, uh, speak is known as speak bitter, um, to raise the people's awareness of class struggles, specifically through tracing the cause of their miserable lives to the landowners as, as criminal acts, such as economic, economic exploitation, political su suppression, physical abuse, uh, and collaboration with the French. Uh, eventually, most landlords and health and wealthy peasants were punished by losing their property, jail, or even executed. Um, the party cadres and the land and Chinese advisor would then redistribute land and property. The DOV implemented a pilot campaign in April and May 1953. To set an example, the DOV chose a lady by the name of Nguyen Thi Nam. So she's in um, that yellow tri uh, square that I drew around, and the person in red is Ho Chi Minh. Uh, who is she? Nguyen Thi Nam is a female landowner and well supporter of and sponsor of the anti colonial revolution. She had hosted Ho Chi Minh. Uh, Vong Nguyen Zaf and all the revolutionary leaders in her plantation during the war. Her two sons were members of the party who were trained in China at the time. Uh, 
But because they wanted to use someone as an example, they chose her to be the first person to execute uh, during the land reform, to set an example for this massive campaign. Um, in a way, I just want to leave it there so that we can reflect on uh, the DOV um, and, and, and their ambition to, to, to push this forward. So despite having won the war, Nice. <laughs> the land reform, however, continue until oh, continue until July 1956. Why is that? Uh, so they were able to mobilize the support of the peasant in order to defeat the French in 1954. Uh, yesterday, we were at dinner. We were I was talking to Sean. Sean talked about his wife's grandfather was a porter from uh, Nian, right, Sean? Tanhua, right? And Tanhua was a region at this particular time which was controlled by the communists. Uh, and they carry out land reform at, in Tanhua as one of the earliest area. Why? Because they wanted to con con convert these people like uh, his wife's grandfather to, into becoming porters to carry out, to carry supplies all the way up to the Indian Fu to support the soldiers up in the Indian Fu in order to fight this war. They were able to, as a result of land reform, mobilize about 200,000 peasants to do this during this uh, period in uh, early 1954. So they defeated the, the French. However, despite winning the, the war, the land reform continued all the way up until July of 1956. Why is that? Uh, because uh, the Geneva Accord uh, in 1954 divided the country into two halves and provisioned a 300 days period where people from both sides could move wherever they want. So northerners can move to the south, southerners can move to the north. At the time, we uh, more, th more than 800,000 to a million northerners moved north and about 100 a thousand southerners move uh, moved north and uh, 800,000 moved south. It kind of balanced the population between the two, right? The north had a, a gain of one million. So for the leaders of the DOV, this was very, uh, wo very worrisome because if there was going to be an election by 1956, controlling the majority of the population would be uh, would, would be very much something that you would want to do and and then so carrying out land reform would allow them to do this why because it would allow them to change the the, the political system at the village level and inc insert their own cadres into the village system whereby they can control the vote uh, and therefore, that's the reason why land reform continued all the way to July 1956 and kind of in, intensified during the period from 1955 to 56, where many people were falsely accused and executed because they wanted to finish this by July, because supposedly election was supposed to happen in July of 1956. So between the program was hastily implemented in only two years. 3,565 communes underwent eight waves of rent reduction and five waves of land reform that changed the face of North Vietnam's rural society. Between December 1954 and 1956, some 40,000, 48,000 cartridges carry out five waves of land reform in 3,314 communes uh, in 22 provinces and cities affecting, affecting 2.5 million households and about 10 million people. So we imagine North Vietnam had a population of 12 million and you affect about 10 million people, that's, that's large. So on the surface, the number reveals that the DRV's ability to bring economic opportunity to the peasant by giving them land, uh, farmland. More importantly, however, the number reflects how mass mobilization, mobilization to carry out land reform structurally transformed rural North Vietnam by breaking the power of the rich and land owning class by removing them from power and inserting new cadres, communist cadres into their position. The number confirmed that the DRV consolidated its power over North Vietnam. Through land reform, the Vietnamese Communist Party and the People's Army established an interdependent relationship to create basis in rural areas for revolutionary authorities. Through instruction aid from China, the party states mobilized peasants trained officer. The army protected the communist basis, developed party membership for the, for the army, 
and eventually seize power of the party uh, for the party by defeating the enemy forces, sp specifically replacing those of the older uh, traditional social class with party members. Specifically, land reform allowed the DOV to admit four million new members into the uh, into the Peasants Association, which is a party control association. Uh, reorganized over nearly 3,000 party cells. Um, by taking control of the countryside, which encompassed the majority of the population as a well of main source uh, of production, and the party states essentially seized control of the well of manpower necessary that not only could defeat the French at Dien Bien Phu, but could outlast the Republic of Vietnam and the US. That's, that's, that kind of answered the question of why they continue to have the number of people to push down even after losing 40,000 people, 30,000 people. Why is because they now have control of the, 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 the total population. So that aspect of the land reform kind of answered that question. Um, the next phase, I would like to move on and discuss the last topic on the Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm. Um, movement. The establishment of modern military and implementation of land reform program helped the DOV defeat French forces at Dien Bien Phu, which eventually led to the end of French colonialism in Vietnam. However, land reform continued to be uh, to, at a more intensified rate, as I mentioned earlier, which led to an overturning of northern Vietnamese society and millions of life. Thus, the benefit the, beneath that veneer of success was a brewing dissatisfaction, much of it attributable to the country's move away from what should be post-war efforts uh, toward peace, prosperity, and freedom uh, in the directions of terrors, chaos, and authoritarianism. The discontentment reached its peak in 1956 when land reform was at its most radical. Symbolic of this discontentment was the uh, was the Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm intellectual dissentant, uh, dissentant reformist movement against the party state. The movement takes its name from two independent publications, Nhân uh, Zai Phẩm, which is uh, masterpieces, and Nhân Văn, which is humanism, humanism, published in Hanoi in 1956, produced by an illustrious ensemble of intellectual writers, artists, and uh, academics. The publication had a handful of period, 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 periodicals and, and essays, fiction, songs, poetry, interviews, cartoons, in which the, the authors criticized the dictatorial, dictatorial and corrupt government of the DRV and demanded liberal reforms and democracy. The Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm movement took shape from the discontentment of the party states increasing intrusive interference with personal and creative freedom, something that the party had promised beforehand, that you know, after defeating the French, then we would have these stuff. Well, uh, this discontentment was permanent in the years since the, later, uh, since the later years of the First Indochina War, when the party began to apply Jun Jin's 1943 cultural outline for Vietnam. Uh, in its governance of cultural activities for the national salvation and development. Uh, influenced by Maoist cultural principle, the role of artists and the goal of cultural activities such as arts and literature are to serve the party state's political goal, which in Vietnamese is văn nghề phục vụ chính trị, right? This policy line was met with disagreements for many artists since 1945, 1946, 1948, through different con uh, conferences when artists would say, no, we can't do this, we can't have this, give us our freedom. Um, but no, the party kept on pushing, said, nope, you have to continue to produce these, uh, these uh, works uh, to promote land reform, to promote against uh, the French. Intellectuals and writers and art artists um, so as the party began to impose more repressive and violent policies, many intellectuals who witnessed the land reform especially had and or had been affected by it, um, made peace with uh, this suffocating atmosphere by hope in hoping that the democracy and freedom promised to them would, would come after the war. However, democracy and freedom never came. Instead, situated within the context of a divided Vietnam uh, and a, a need to obtain a show of political loyalty from the population, the party state to continue its restrictive policies. Arts and literature continue to be managed by the rigid guidelines 
land reform spread into newly acquired Delta region became intensely uh, and became intensely violent by the summer of 1953. Under these conditions, intellectuals who had accepted the, 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 the restrictive atmosphere began to criticize the party state policy, planting the seed for the Nyan Van Zaifa movement. In 1955, Authors, uh, intellectuals such, such as Chan Zan Tu Fat, Quan Gum, Don Yun, uh, and many others uh, signed a proposal demanding for creative freedom and, uh, in the army. As a result, the party denounced them and uh, placed them uh, in prison and sent them to carry out land reform as a punishment. The issue is noteworthy for its... Uh, so during this time, as some of them were punished, uh, others published the first uh, first journal, Zaifa Mosun, Masterpieces of the Spring. Um, um, in spring of 1956, the first publication containing nine poems, two songs, and two short stories, the issue expressed discontentment uh, with the party while making a call for a new explore exploration in artistic creativity. The issue is noteworthy for, for that and for really it was published during Tet of Vietnam. Tet is New Year, right? But uh, the articles and, and, and the pieces in the journal were very gloomy. Um, the reason is because they want to present a contrast from what the reality of, uh, of the time was. They wanted to tell the people, hey, reality is life is not fun here, right? We need to speak up, we need to stand up, we need to, to, to demand our freedom to express this thing we can't just ignore it and say that hey everything is good because we won the war already so the pub the publication garnered immediate support quickly building a readership and sim stimulating discussion however the party states was displeased and the publication was was withdraw withdrawn from circulation uh, less than two weeks after its release marking the beginning of the party state suppression of intellectual dissident uh, dissident movement However, social discontentment in 1956 was not unique only to North Vietnam. The year 1956 was also a, a, a tumultuous one among uh, uh, the communist world. Uh, the series of events revealed tension between many communist states and their people. Uh, you know, you, you have the protests in Poland, in Hungary, and then, um, uh, but the most crucial was of uh, Khrushchev's denoun denouncing of Stalin in, in 19, so which happened also during this time when the f first publication came out, and of course later Mao Zedong's 100 uh, Flowers Movement, right? So, so all these happened, um, happened, and the um, the communist state was basically like looking at China and the Soviet Union and saying like, what should we do? Uh, uh, Khrushchev is denouncing Stalin, uh, but we need to look at China and, and, and the Soviet Union to, to see, we don't know what to do. So for the next basically three, four, five months, they waited to see how China and the Soviet Union would react. And um, by May 2nd, 1956, pressured by this new Soviet line, Mao Zedong pr pr proposed let a hundred flowers bloom and let a hundred uh, schools contend, uh, in which he calls for freedom of expression in a way, uh, as, um, right? And as a result, because China did this, the Vietnamese government had no other choice but to also do that with the Vietnamese and allow the uh, these authors to continue to publish uh, these uh, um, journals. So this freedom, however, was um, so once Mao and the CCP sketch out a path, the DRV, who up until this point still rely on China's aid and revolutionary advice, follows suit. By this time, it had no other choice but to liberalize uh, since its two most important supporter had moved forward with it. It was under this inter international development following the aftermath of the secret speech combined with the rising domestic discontentment in all uh, parts of Northern society as a result of land reform. Um, from August 26, um, August 8 to 26, 1956, uh, 3, 300 writers came together to demand more freedom and, and democracy. Uh, from August to November of 1956, Nyan Van Zaifa movement experienced its golden age. Uh, 
uh, produce a total of like nine publication um, asking for democracy, freedom, freedom of ex expression, and, and whatnot, uh, along with other journals, Chum Hoa, Dap Sang Fibin, which is uh, 100 Flowers, uh, and then Noi uh, That Speak Truth, Nat Mai New Land, San Tao Creativity. So you can see by the names of all these journals what they are trying to express. Well, at, However, the Hungarian and the revolution uh, in Hungary in October of uh, 23rd in 1956 put an end to North Vietnam's short-lived inter intellectual thought. After the Soviet Union's suppression, suppression of the Hungarian revolt in early November 1956 and the outbreak of a rural riot in Quyen Lu, Nghe An, which is uh, as a result of the land reform, uh, there was a riot uh, happening in this same basically district where Ho Chi Minh was uh, was born, right? Uh, and so the the government sent in a division to suppress that, uh, and as a result, beginning of the the phase where the government started to suppress uh, all these movement. Uh, the the movement's last um, publication, Nhân Văn Number Six. Um, promised that they would publish a special issues on the Hungarian event and uh, to 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 advocate for people to take uh, to 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 go down to the street and protest. However, party members and workers at the publishing house recognized this and informed authorities, uh, resulting in the authorities confiscating the uh, the the newspaper and then putting these um, authors uh, under house arrest. In December fifteenth, nineteen fifty six. Having hesitated for two years, the DOV began to strike back against the intellectuals by publishing editorials and commentaries and even letters from audience to condemn anti-socialist reactionaries. The government began a more aggressive campaign against the Nyan Van Zaifam movement, harassing editors of the Nyan Van Zaifam by accusing them of breaking the law and failing to, failing to deposit three copies of the journal to the central press office before publication. It shut down the movement, closed the office, arrested key participant. Some were imprisoned and sent to re-education re camp while others were made to, to, to undertake self-criticism. -criti In July uh, 8, 1957, the anti-writers movement campaign in China began. This at, Also at this particular time, Ho Chi Minh was in China uh, on his way to Korea and the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Uh, on his way back, Ho stopped in Beijing and witnessed what was happening in China with the anti rightist movement and was inspired by it. So he came back and um, used the, 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 the pen name Chen Le uh, and published an article in uh, the Nyanzhen, the party's mouthpiece, uh, on September 16, 1957, in which titled Smashing the Right Wing Ideology, uh, condemning it as an independent thought, harmful and easily spread like weeds. Uh, another editorial in Yansan declared that we, quote, we cannot allow anyone to take advantage of democracy and freedom of speech to separate people from the party. The Yansan Zaifa movement, movement was extinguished thereafter. Thus the massive campaign headed, thus a massive campaign right after this, continuing all the way from 1958, uh, 57, all the way to 1960, uh, headed by the poet Dohu, who is a member of the Central Committee uh, of, the Water, uh, of the Workers' Party, um, in charge of cultural, artistic, and propaganda work, uh, put on a massive campaign to denounce all participants in this movement. Uh, many of them, uh, five individuals were uh, harshly punished uh, to um, the uh, the publisher, for example, was put in uh, 15 years of imprisonment, and after he was re released, it was constantly being monitored by the government in uh, the late 70s. Um, so Nhân Văn Zai Phạm movement seems like an interlude in North Vietnam's political history, uh, which it did not last long, uh, but its legacy still impact to this very day. Anybody, uh, when you go to Vietnam, or if you talk to anybody, you mention Nhân Văn Zai Phạm. 
they know that it's the most important movement in, in modern Vietnamese history uh, or 20th century Vietnamese uh, history. Um, it was the first and most formative event in political dissidence under the DOV rule. And the issue raised by the dissidents in the 1950s remain unchanged today. Why? Because to this very day in, in Vietnam, the press is still controlled by the government. Um, Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm is a reference point for those who want political reform, the re restorations of intra-party uh, democratization and greater intellectual freedom. Although Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm is still sensitive to present uh, Hanoi, it cannot be neglected because it continues to be a rallying point. So anybody who advocate for democracy and freedom, they always reference Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm as a point. Uh, the movement, in a way, is also a bridge for the younger generation as they have aspiration for freedom to express themselves, to write, um, uh, and, and as a way to link back to the past. Uh, so how the regime respond to this event, um, even today, tells about the state's political reform in Vietnam. However, despite its legacy, Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm, and, and, and its legacy and that Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm being a rallying point, it must be recognized that it is also a, it also, also that the negative impact due to what happened to it by, by the, the, the regime, um, it has in a way became, as a result of what happened in 1956, 57, it has kind of shunned uh, and, 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 and basically shunned the growth of, of any desire for uh, to ask for democracy and freedom of expression uh, since then so for the past 60 or 70 years so since then people were much more reluctant to speak up against suppression and authoritarianism uh, especially during the height of the vietnam war so this goes back to uh, to something that i tried to address so sean yesterday when he presented his paper right he was talking about in in the south how diverse it, it was multiple different uh groups p political uh, affiliation and and whatnot speaking of uh um to 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 zim to two and whatnot you don't get that in north vietnam after this why because after this the uh, regime created um state-sponsored bureaucratic mechanisms such as the vietnam's writers association for example as 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 bureaucratic mechanism to control public opinion anything you want to publish has to go through these channels as before it would be released, for example, for many years. So as a result, uh, war continue for this 20 years from 1956 to, 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 to 70. You would imagine if you have 40, you lost 40,000 people during Tet, people would of course ha have doubt, have questioned, but how come you don't hear any of those? Partly because the North was able to control all these narratives and not allow anybody to raise all these, these questions of about sacrificing, about the, the, the loss of numbers. And therefore, you don't have these issues in the North, uh, whereas in the South, because of its aspiration to be at least free, uh, at least the press is freer. And as a result, you have a more dynamic of uh, and, and differing showing. And that's the reason, the reason why I, I, I use this quote at the beginning from someone who participated in the war, who who was influenced by the northern narrative to got to get into the war. Her grandfather were landlords. She was uh, her family were persecuted and she was she was discriminated. But then volunteered to get in, to 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 join the war. When she reached Saigon in 1975, she came to realization that all these I heard about Saigon was misinformed. And so she cried as an author. She cried because she came to realization that, oh, shoot, all these publications we never got in the North. And so my talk, I will end it right here. Uh, so I basically link these three issues, the establishment of the uh, military, the land reform, and the Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm affair in a way, if you can look at them, not in terms of, you know, separately, but if you look at them together, they make sense in allowing the North to create a, a society, a country in which they continue, can continue a war that lasts 
lasted 20 years. So I would end my talk right there. So I did. Yay, any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much for a very informative talk. And I have a Thomas. <laughs> great, great talk. Uh, I want to challenge you, though, on, on, on policy land reform. Right. Because the, the argument is often made that land reform, of course, uh, backfires. It, it produces a, a difficulties in, in actually managing or producing uh, a goods. It, I also didn't completely follow the logic of the regime in pursuing land reform through July of 1956 if they were concerned uh, about numbers because it would seem land reform encouraged uh, departure from North Vietnam of people to the South, which would add to the South's electoral weight if, if elections had taken place. So I guess this is sort of a question of, uh, with a, a few dimensions. One is is the regime's policy, but the other, the larger issue, I, I, I see the point about land reform in terms of control of populations and, and the uh, victory of dividend food, but in longer terms, did it, did it damage the agricultural uh, uh, successes of, of the North compared, because land reform is often seen as having had del deleterious effects in the Soviet Union and, right. and, and right. Um, China. Yeah, just wondering, did it have more winners than losers in that sense? Right. To, uh, that's two part to your, your yeah. question. In, in, uh, the, the first, you know, if they continue to carry out land reform and if it's this bad, then wouldn't that push people to, to the, the, the open space was only 300 days, right, all the way to July of uh, supposedly to April of 1955 when people can move. But that was then extended all the way to June, right? Um, at this particular time, the North came out with many uh, degrees with telling cadres to pass land reform in the in the um, in the provinces near the, uh, the the near the sea, the coastal region, so that people would not leave. Through remember, at this particular time, people left by uh, by French uh, boats US and uh, U.S. Uh, ships and 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 French yeah. British, and so people would come down to Haiphong. And, and, and leave. So they would say, no, nope, let's try to convince these people to stay back, right? Uh, during, during Christmas, they would ask land reform cadres to, to go to churches and, 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 and put together a Christmas tree to, to convince them to stay back. And because most landowners or rich peasants were Christians, especially along the coastal regions, right? So they asked the cadres to pass these, uh, these land reform implementation until after 300 days. But they continue to carry that out in other regions, in the highlands and in the mountainous areas and, and, and whatnot. That's to do with that, that question that you, you just asked. And the other one is that land reform, yeah, after land reform, they move quickly to collectivization, right? They promise people land, but they immediately take land away from, from, from folks. And they, uh, for the objective of producing, right? Producing in order to, to, to get ready for the next war, right? So they try different ways, right? Try different type of seeds, uh, rice seeds in order to produce as much as possible. So during the first few years, it was, it was negative, a negative because they, they didn't know what they were doing. Right, um, and it took them some time before they could really re regroup and, and, and figure a way to increase production. Yeah. So, where does the rectification of error? So, rectification of error occurs in um, beginning in late uh, 1956 as a result of, of all, all these stuff, so uh, desalinization for and and the Yen Ren Zaifa movement. All these happens at the same time, and but then they did. Uh, rectification of error after completing land reform, right? So they knew that they would need to complete land reform before the election, right? Before the supposed schedule election. And then after that, um, they would then carry out collect, uh, rectification of error. The reason why I, I, I put it in quotation is because error was already known years before. Right. Uh, if, if you read land reform documents, you see that, you know, report comes back. Hey, we are punishing a lot of people who uh, we are falsely accusing them. You know, many errors have been created, uh, you know, have been caused and, 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 and whatnot. So they knew errors was, was already, but then they needed to correct it 
in order to appease peoples so that there would not be revolt and, and whatnot. So correct uh, rectification of errors uh, continue, uh, started in um, the fall of 1956 and carried on all the way to 1957, 1958. Okay. So, Sean? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, one thing that I find really striking uh, or spending more of my time working on the South is, uh, well, we had a really interesting discussion about the comparison between Vietnam and Korea, but I also find it interesting to compare um, the Southern government under ZM and the military state that follows with the North. And it's really striking to me how many parallels there are uh, in many ways. Uh, so for example, like the land reform campaign, land to the tiller in the South in 1970 is, effectively just accepting communist land reforms that had already taken place in the South. Um, many of the media laws in the South uh, mimic some of the features that you mentioned. So for example, the need to um, submit copies for review in advance to pay a large deposit as a, a fine in case um, anything that's published with the government is uh, not uh, on board with. Uh, we see journalists being in prison for long terms in the South as well. Um, even some of the political structures. So the Khan Lao Party is kind of widely compared to the Communist Party among Southern constituents. I think that Nguyen Van Thieu's Democracy Party especially is uh, regarded as very kind of overtly trying to emulate the Communist Party structure. Um, but it's interesting that none of these are really successful in the same way in the South. And, I wonder, is there a risk in uh, focusing so much on the state itself and um, the bureaucracy, some of its more coercive and manipulative efforts, if uh, we risk missing, it's a bit of an academic buzzword, I guess, but, but forgive me, uh, miss risking or, or risk missing the um, agency of ordinary people uh, and the uh, contributions that they in turn make to um, determining uh, the meaning of something like the Vietnam War and the extent to which these structures either succeed or are resisted. Oh no, definitely. I mean, like my, my, uh, my, my, the book that I'm working on have you know uh, multiple chapters devoted to just you know um, the peasants and how they feel about the whole issues. You know whether they were against or for it and how they felt about it. A lot of the peasants that I interviewed, they're like, oh, it's great. This is the first time ever in our life where we receive a small plot of land. You know, uh, we never had you know, So I expressed that in, in, in my writing too. Uh, this is just, you know, part of me trying to frame how it, the, such a policy was viewed from the, the, the uh, and was reasoned from the perspective of the, the leadership. And then I also have that section where it, how it was interpreted by the people who were affected by by it and also other people who would who got their land taken away and 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 was per, persecuted and how they continue to for example zoom to whom right we we the, the, that's why we're, yesterday we were talking during dinner about the complexity of war right often when we talk about the vietnam war we often talk about two sides and fighting as though everything was you know, the reality is like zoom to whom who's Grandfather, uh, parents were, were were denounced as a result of being landlords. Her parents and herself were discriminated. Yet she had to volunteer, or she volunteered to be a part of that very regime that that did that to her family. Right. So all those are the complexities that I I, I, I address in my uh, my uh, my book um, too. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, uh, no, uh, oh. first, if I could just interrupt, we have an online question. Uh, thank you for your wonderful paper. Did you find data on the equivalence of land reform in Mekong Delta during the early 1960s? 50s, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, uh, um, uh, thank you for the question. I actually, to be honest, I, uh, I, I haven't, and uh, I, um, um, uh, I haven't really focused much on on this. My my my, my study of the land reform uh, mostly focused on the north. Even though the 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 uh, the DRV and I, I think I get your question here. Um, carry out land reform also in the Mekong Delta wherever they had more uh, control, even in the central in Guangai and Binding, where they have more control in the 50s. Uh, my own 
grand uncle uh, was a land quote unquote landlord um, was also affected by by this. And, and when I said landlord here, it got to a point where if you own a buffalo, you're categorized as a landlord. Um, so uh, if you are a teacher, you could also be categorized as a rich peasant and, 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 and whatnot. So to answer your question, no, I don't have a lot of data on, uh, on the land reform in the uh, Mekong Delta, and especially partly not because I'm, I was avoiding to, 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 to do any work on it. Records in the archive do not have a lot of records uh, on the land reform and data on land reform in the Mekong Delta as uh, they would uh, in the north, possibly because of the distance at the particular time, uh, even though uh, the DOV had control of certain areas in the Mekong Delta, but there is still a gap in between so that records don't really flow back to the north as easily as records of land reforms being carried out in the north uh, that is today available today in the archive. Uh, you seem to say that land reform uh, was conceived as a means to win the 1956 election and it was finished just in time just for that. And I have a bit there remaining uh, empirical evidence for that because I can readily understand that uh, land reform would, would uh, create uh, people who are grateful to the party, uh, and it, it, it also would be a means to uh, to control the population. But uh, so as a consequence to turn elections in the right direction, it's very easy to understand. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, is there any specific uh, uh, Party directive or so on, saying it must be finished in time, so as to uh, so as to win the, the election. Yeah, not not a lot, but there are definitely documents that said, "Hey, we need to finish this uh, before such and such date." Uh, before the try to finish this before the election, um, I don't think they meant to say finish the election. Uh, finish the land reform in order to win the election, but uh, it's important to because they also understand how violent the land reform is, and in order. Uh, well, it was a program as such. It's a communist party. What happened? <laughs> so, what do you expect? Uh, uh, with or without the election uh, for the unification, uh, land reform was an objective of the party as 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 such in internal. Uh, internal necessity uh, if it was part of the program. No, I, 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 I understand fairly well, but the thing is that if, for example, if we have a reunification election, right, uh, where everybody could go and cast a vote, uh, being able to have control over a particular village of how people would, or how you can intimidate people in terms of how they vote uh, or persuade them in, in how they vote, would be very because the uh, because they the north could foresee that you know during that two years the the south could have you know tried to manipulate the popul the southern population so it knew that it had a one million uh, people uh, advantage uh, in the north in terms of so it was trying at this particular time to try to to have as many people under its control as uh, as as soon as possible. So what happens, like if you look at the timeline of how the land reform was carried out, it was carried out through in waves. So each waves, initially when it was designed, before before they knew that there was such an election or anything, before the Geneva Accord, right? So it was designed before that. Each wave were given a certain numbers of months to complete, like four months, five months. But as when when the Geneva Accords were, was developed and signed and, and established all these dates and deadlines, these waves were shortened in order to, right, it was shortened from four months down to two months to finish this wave. But the number of, 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 of regions to be, for, for which land reform would be carried out was expanded. 
So you can see that they were chasing after time uh, in order to finish it as soon as possible. And then that as a result led to what we call the, the errors that, that, that happens because now they are forcing cadres to just go and, and, and basically get rid of as, as many as people, including party members themselves, right? As a way to turn over uh, and, and re replace these party members with new party members. And that's why you have the uh, Guinglu revolt the Wing Lu revolt is re as a result of the correction of rectification of errors, and they these are all party members who uses that as a, re a chance to revolt against the newer cadres, uh, and so of course immediately the uh, government sent down um, uh, a, a a whole division to suppress them. Yeah. We have time. Or we have time. Um. Oh, we have about we we are it's about the end. Um, yeah. Because uh, I wanted to ask about uh, gender. Because in that first case, I don't know. Uh, the first person, the first victim was a woman. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there's a famous line by Ho Chi Minh. I I actually have a uh, I, I I have a whole article on on on, on this woman and why they chose her. As a first, uh, first. The, so the, there's a famous line when um, she was chosen by supposedly by the Chinese uh, advisor to um, La Quibo and, and and others, basically saying that we need to pick someone to 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 use as an example. Why not pick the person who who is who who committed most to us, and and to basically to also demonstrate to the cadres that that we are willing to go this far. In, in order, Ho Chi Minh supposedly, when he learned about the decision to execute her, before executing her, uh, cried and said, "Do we run out of, land of of landlords? Why do we have to execute this person, the first person? And why why do we have to pick the, the first person to be a woman, and and, and whatnot?" So I kind of um, the, the the article that I wrote kind of. Um, Corrected that narrative by by saying that no Ho Chi Minh had all the time to 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 call uh, call off on that he was he was basically forty miles away from the ex supposedly uh, uh, a a very close uh, person to him at the particular reported recently in a me in a memoir saying that on the day of her execution he dresses differently cover his beard. And went to the execution site to witness the the the, the whole idea. and then returned a, 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 several weeks later and wrote an article calling saying landlords are bad, criticizing her in a separate article under a different pseudonym, not Ho Chi Minh, under the name C B. C B in Vietnamese is Guo Bac, meaning of Uncle Uncle Ho. So uh, so this article that I, I wrote kind of depict Ho Chi Minh in a very more complex. Um, um, angle in that sense and explain why they chose her. Yes. Well, I think that's all the time we have. And so thank you very, very much. Thank you. I would like to welcome Dr. Hosub Ship. He earned his bachelor's degree at mili in military history at Korea Military Academy, his master's degree in political history at, Was at Waseda University in Japan and his doctorate in military history at the University of Kansas, where his major professor was Dr. Adrian Lewis. Dr. Shim is assistant professor in the military history department of his undergraduate alma mater, Korea Military Academy. Now Dr. Shim will present his paper, Politics by Other Means, ROK Forces Establishment of the Relationship with U.S. Forces in the Vietnam War. Dr. Shim, the floor is yours. My topic is how the South Korean forces in Vietnam made a relationship with the U.S. forces in the Vietnam War by focusing on the specific topic, like the operational control issue. So I wonder how much do you know about South Koreans in the Vietnam War? Actually, the South, actually South Korea sent a total of uh, 300 and 20,000 troops to Vietnam from 1965 to 1973. And their annual number is about 50,000 from 1967 to 1971. And there are 
uh, many argument when, as you see the, the slide and how well, it's interesting to see that South Korea was second largest foreign presence after the United States in the Vietnam War. And uh, most of literature uh, discussing about South Koreans in the Vietnam War, they talk about the South Korea's motivation for the participation. And I can say there were like, there are like three main motivations. And as you see my slide, the first one is strengthen its national security by enhancing the overall US rock alliance. So it seems something like the prevent, because at the time there were uh, US army in South Korea, but still we have US army, US one division in South Korea, but at the time we have two US army divisions and South Korean government want to prevent US forces in South Korea's withdrawal from South Korea. And also they want to gain military aids and modernize the South Korean army. And there are also big reasons like uh, gaining economic benefits because South Korea was a very poor country and they depended the most of their uh, financial, uh, financial from the US. And then especially for the military, we have to depending on 100% from the US aids. So they really wanna uh, gain lots of economic benefits from the Vietnam War. So, and as the war continued, since South Korea lost their uh, national security issue with the United States because of the Vietnamization phase, and also South Korea had a problem with the, the new Nixon government after 1968. So more and more gaining economic benefits uh, became the primary motivation as the participation proceeded. And there's also another, the other reason that the Park Chung-hee, at the time the Korean president, he wanted to strengthen his authoritative, authoritative the re regime. So that was one of the uh, other motivation that South Korea had for their participation. So next, please. And then, because when I'm when thinking about the Korean forces relationship with the US forces in Vietnam, uh, as I told you, I focused on the ex who exercised operational control over the ROC forces in Vietnam. Because at the time, the US forces in South Korea, in Korea, exercised op OPCON, operational control over all Korean ROC forces. So I wonder that how about in Vietnam? And there were like two arguments, two different arguments. And most of Korean generals and Korean officers or Korean scholars are saying that rock forces in Vietnam exercised an independent OPCON in, during the Vietnam War. But many of US generals says, actually the Korean forces was, were under our de facto OPCON. So it's very controversial issue, issue still between the two forces. And if Koreans had an independent OPCON, I wonder how and why South Koreans gained an independent OPCON, especially under the certain power dynamics between the United States and the Korean forces. So this is my question uh, on my paper. And please, next. So I just want a brief history that how South Korea sent their troops. So after the Gulf of Tonk Tonkin incident on August 2nd, 2nd, 1964, the US, US's full-fledged involvement in Vietnam started, as you know, and Johnson government implemented the more flag policy and South Korea answered the Americans' uh, request. And first time they sent about 140 members for medical aid and instructing the Korean uh, the martial arts, Taekwondo in 1964. And in March, 1965, as you see the picture down here, they sent 2000 troops 
uh, in non-combat units, we called DAO, DOG. So you can see DOG here. And this right picture, you can see their departure from Busan to Saigon. So next, please. But sending combat troops to Vietnam was another level of decision for South Korea. And it was Seoul who wanted to send their combat troops for seeking national interest. And when Washington decided to send its combat troops to Vietnam in April 1965, and they want to escalate the war, the Americans became willing to employ South Korean combat troops. Well, before that, South Korean government, you know, suggested they want to send combat troops, but United States uh, refused that. But now Washington wants Koreans to send their troops. So from Washington's perspective, Korean soldiers were cheap, yet well-trained. And moreover, their presence could justify America's Vietnam War, especially uh, since Koreans were Asians, just like the Vietnamese. So look at this picture. This guy left side, he's President Park, and he was actually the first Korean president who had a car parade in the middle of New York City. So this means he was really warmed, welcomed by the US government. And the right side picture was like a US rock summit on 17 uh, May, 1965. So Johnson, at the time, the US President Johnson officially requested the dispatch of South Korean combat troops, but Park Jong-hee did not confirm it. Even though Park had already made up his mind to send combat troops, he intended to start bargaining with the US to reap more benefits. The South Korean government kept bargaining with Washington and as a result, in addition to the financial support for its deployment, Seoul also received an American promise to cancel their plan to reduce the USFK, the US forces in Korea, Korea as well as to provide uh, additional economic benefits and military aid and support. And I think most importantly at this moment, the two countries' interests coincided. South Korea was able to achieve its own in national interest in their decision of dispatching combat troops while the US could gain the actual boots on the ground. According to some historians, South Korea and the US started a honeymoon relationship when Seoul decided, send, decided to send its combat troops to Vietnam in response to US's request. Oh, next, please. <clears throat> oh. However, Seoul or South Korea had a pessimistic view on the prospect of the Vietnam War. So for example, Minister of Defense Kim Sung-un expressed the ROC military's perspective on the Vietnam War. And against one congressman's question, he agreed that the prospects of, for the war was, were never bright. And he argued the reason we are sending our troops to Vietnam is not that the condition of the patient has a possibility to be improved, but because the patient would die if we were not sending our troops. At first, he should prevent the patient from dying and then find a way to survive him, or at least we need to earn time to save him, quote. Korea has a dilemma and they have to do raise their own national prestige, but also they want to keep its troops casualties down. So they have to find other ways to find how to fight in Vietnam. So if they want to find differently from the US forces, uh, they should not be under the US operational control. And next please. So they had a conflict, and as you see here, the, when the Korean combat troops arrived, arrived, 
uh, a draft of joint memorandum indicating where the U.S. forces would exercise open over ROC forces in Vietnam was provided. But General Che, the commander of ROC forces, he never signed it, as you see the circle in this document. And next, please. And in the negotiation with the West Moland, Che Myung Shin argued that Koreans should exercise independent opcon, and he raised many reasons. But in this negotiation, they only compromised that the compromise and coordination instead of who is exercising opcon over rock forces. And under this situation, please, next, please. U.S. forces had uh, negative estimates uh, toward the rock forces, but they also the evaluation also got better in the higher the level uh, echelon of the U.S. Army because they desperately wanted the Koreans. So I argue the U.S. forces also had a dilemma that they want to South Korea Korean forces despite their unsatisfactory conduct. Next, please. And anyway, in 1967, the Koreans became the core size because they have additional ninth divisions uh, surge and arrival in Vietnam. And Koreans became bigger and the United States could not ignore Koreans anymore. So they finally uh, understood the Koreans uh, exercise op operational control over their forces and they made parallel command instead of combined command. And as you see this, this slide. Uh, next. And next, please. And I argue that there are three reasons why U.S. admit the Koreans uh, would exercise over their own forces. And you can check this slide. And next, please. And I think there are two implications. And one is in the big picture, one might say that the two country, I mean the US and South Koreans different conduct because Americans focusing on the search and destroy and South Koreans focusing on the pacification operations balanced in the military efforts to pacify South Vietnam. But I wanna say nevertheless, the reality of war was not that simple. In reality, cooperation and coordination were not that smooth and easy and mainly because of each country's different interest in the same war. And also I wanna mention that many are arguing that South Koreans uh, should uh, gain the operational op or control from the United States now, from now on, because still the United States have this operational control over rock forces. But I want to say uh, the alliance between the US and South Korea could be strengthened or weakened and operational control does not matter as we expect. So I want to say uh, operational issue cannot be the essence of the alliance. And at least the Korean people should know that taking operational control does not necessarily mean the deterioration of US and Iraq alliance. And we have to see how South Koreans did in Vietnam. Uh, Laurent Cesari, professor of uh, history, uh, University of Arras in France. Uh, South Korean troops were conspicuous during the Vietnam War for the number of the war crimes. Do you, how yes. do you account for that? Uh, has it something to do with operational control? Uh, right. So that's well, that's a big, big, big issue for me too because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. As a scholar, I saw many documents, the U.S. documents that are delineating the South Koreans' massacre and war crimes in the Vietnam War. And I seriously checked it and, but as a, uh, inside of South Korea, it's really hard to speak out. And especially my status as a military officer in the Iraq army uh, it's really hard to talk about it, but uh, in early December, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about the South Koreans' pacification or counterinsurgency operations during the Vietnam War.
And I want to mention about that, but instead of es escaping that the kind of controversy between the South Koreans committed the, the war crimes or South Koreans did not, and it was only the communist propaganda, I want to escape the both kind of argument. And I want to uh, say, oh, I'm not going to argue myself, but I want to uh, cite the US document and how the US evaluates the South Korean pacification during the Vietnam War. And that way I can uh, deal with this kind of problem, but it's really hard, literally. I mean, uh, in the literature and in, it's not only in the scholar, but also it's kind of become the political issue inside South Korea, not only political, but also diplomatic issue between South Korea and Vietnam, the war crimes, South Koreans war crimes became the kind of big issue. And it's really hard to say about that in public. Hello, I'm uh, uh, Thomas Schwartz. I'm a professor of history at Vanderbilt University. Um, I'm curious to what extent the um, agreement with Japan, the normalization treaty, which came in uh, 65, was also a part of Park's strategy. Um, and because Washington was pushing very hard for that treaty. And one of the suspicions of the Koreans was that they were trying to offload Korea to Japan effectively, or that, that economic assistance. So I'm wondering to what extent the decision on Vietnam might have been influenced by this. Well, I think there are two, two, two factors that influenced the Park decision to send its troops to Vietnam. And the first one, well, because Park and the Koreans were very angry about that, as you know, and Park want to find some other you know, exit that Koreans, uh, he want to satisfy the Korean people. And that's, that's one of the reasons why Park uh, mm -hmm. uh, strengths, I mean, uh, stress that we have to become we have to survive and we have to be rich and we have to develop our e economy, but he actually doesn't have enough sources and money. That's why he want to, you know, negotiate with Japan and also he want to find many other ways, but also he, by sending combat troops to Vietnam, he persuaded his people that this is not only strengthened our national security, but this is a good chance for us to earn money. And that's one of the reasons why he wants to turn the, the, the public's you know, view into kind of Vietnam. And, uh, and that, that way, one, one way worked. And also he won in the relationship was in the US, because when you see the, the negotiation with Japan, the South Koreans is not that very, very much active. And he want to find out that how, he would find out some kind of leverage then he want to negotiate with the US and sending combat troops to Vietnam was the exactly right, you know, tool or method or the way that he can make it as a leverage. So, before and after the, the Jap Japanese negotiation, I think this kind of flow is very uh, interesting to see how President Park or Park Regiment, Park, uh, Park government find a way to deal with the United States. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, I'm Sean Fear. I'm a lecturer in international history at the University of Leeds in the UK. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk, and I think the question of operational control is really interesting because it relates uh, to broader questions about sovereignty uh, and identity. Um, yes. I teach a class at the University in Leeds called Global Vietnam War, and we have a week where we focus specifically on South Korean participation in the war. And my question is uh, slightly broader than what you talked about in your presentation, but I wanted to ask you your views on how um, Korean involvement in Vietnam is remembered uh, as part of popular culture and how it contributes to a sense of 
uh, national identity. So I, I have my students read uh, Hong Suk Yong in the Shadow of Arms. Uh, we yes. look at images of uh, how the Vietnam War is presented in the Korean National History Museum. Uh, and there's also a popular film. Uh, the English title is Sunny from 2008 by Lee Jun In. Uh, Lee Jun In, I think. I don't know if you know this film. I don't know the Korean title, but it's a very yeah. kind of positive, uh, affirming. A affirmative view of this time. I I'm just curious, though, what you make of what seem like very different ways of uh, remembering Korean involvement in Vietnam. Well, it's a really interesting question. Thank you so much. And, and before saying it's divided, but I want to say the Vietnam War is, is forgotten war in South Korea. Like, you know the many reason why. And I think most of the big reason is Vietnam War became unpopular as the Vietnamization phase started. And then South Koreans lost their motivation. And especially after their withdrawal, South Vietnam disappeared. So they couldn't find their contribution. And since President Park or authoritative regimes was criticized after uh, in 1980s and their decision to participate in Vietnam was generally or criticized by public. And then we, as the war crimes and all those issues came out, but we think it's not my, it's none of my business. So it's, I think it's totally forgotten. And some people are trying to remember it, but there are still, we have still veterans of the Vietnam War, but they don't, they, they are forgotten, but they also want to say, also justify themselves that we didn't do anything wrong and we are called from our government and we went to Vietnam to help my family and to uh, raise my country to be like this. So they want to make, uh, want public for, or want the Korean people to remember them and their country, at least their contribution for the modernization of Korea, but people are not uh, taking care of that. So I think all those issues are very complicated in Korean society right now and people are easily forgetting it because they don't want to make it a problem, I mean. But as long as I researched or studied the Vietnam War, at least at first, Korean people supported their participation in the Vietnam War. Thank it's, you. That was very interesting for me, yeah. yeah. And Thank then you. Koreans, Thank because of not only help South Vietnam, or not only help the United States, but it was their first uh, historical dispatch to other countries. And they know that South Korea had a war, Korean war only before like a 10, 15 years ago. And that poor country is now sending troops to other countries to help others. It's making them a national nationality and not also make them like a pride. pride. So, it was interesting that they saw the Vietnamese boom in the middle of 1960s. So that's kind of my answer. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm just going to uh, introduce um, the Ludna, who I think everybody already knows. Ludna is an independent historian and she's uh, preparing a book, uh, which I guess this will be a synthesis of, uh, Prime Minister Olaf uh, Palma, uh, Sweden and the Vietnam War, a Diplomatic uh, History, which is gonna be published with what press? Uh, uh, Lexington Books. Okay, okay. Um, and so, um, well, I guess it's time to... Uh... Uh, thank you, Lori. I'll try to cover everything in half an hour, but please stop me at 45 minutes if I go too long. Um, Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palma was the, not the first leader in Western Europe to condemn the American military intervention in Southeast Asia. Eight years before Palma assumed his office in 1969, French President Charles de Gaulle had warned his American counterpart, John F. Kennedy, against the pursuit of a neo-colonial role in Vietnam. De Gaulle did not want the United States to make the same mistake that his own country had made during the colonial period. The French president, according to his memoirs, warned the younger man with profound foresight. You will find that intervention in this area will be an endless entanglement. 
Once a nation has been aroused, no foreign power, however young, can impose its will upon it. You will discover this for yourselves. You Americans wanted to take our place in Indochina. Now you will want to take over where we let off and will and revive a war which we brought to an end. I predict that you will sink step by step into a bottomless military and political quagmire, however much you spend in men and money. Neutral Sweden would also come to oppose the American intervention in Vietnam, but with far greater moral vociferousness. Paradoxically, this opposition was sustained both by Swedish collaboration with other Western European countries and by Swedish neutrality. So in effect, Sweden was acting in concert with Western Europe and on its own at the same time. Um, this official position of neutrality enabled Sweden to empathize with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam as a small independent nation. Long before um, the controversy over the Vietnam War inflamed the world, Olaf Palma questioned its morality. When Palma, as Minister Without Portfolio, addressed the issue in 1965, he saw the popular Vietnamese struggle as part of a broader colonial fight for uh, liberation in Asia and Africa. We must learn to live with it and perhaps also for it. Yet once he became prime minister in 1969, uh, Palma conducted a delicate balancing act. While he actively opposed the American intervention in Vietnam, he strove to maintain a relationship with Washington. When the prime minister visited the United States in June of 1970, his criticism of the war was measured and cautious. You say that the people of Vietnam should have the opportunity for self-determination, an interview noted on the Today Show, a program on the NBC television network. Do you think they would have that opportunity if the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong took over? And Paul Ma responded in kind of a wishy-washy fashion. It's very difficult to say. We can't speak of democracy in the same way as we do in our countries. But the prime minister did go on to explicitly state only that I think the NLF, to a large extent, has represented the national aspirations of the Vietnamese people. Um, Palma employed his rhetoric, polite though it was, as an expression of official Swedish neutrality. He opposed the Vietnam War for its violation of Vietnamese self-determination. Superpower aggression against one small country threatened all the others. Addressing his American audience, during his June 1970 visit to the United States, Palma said, the superpowers are now in a position to destroy themselves, but in so doing, they'll destroy the others. But the small nations cannot escape being affected by their actions. This is why the small nations would like to have a word in the councils. In December of 1970, Palma met with US Ambassador Jerome Holland in a Stockholm. And the prime minister expressed his worry, not only about the effects of the US bombing campaign against North Vietnam, but also about US aerial reconnaissance over North Vietnam. And um, he said to Ambassador Holland, we cannot understand how one expects that someone could willingly accept overflights by reconnaissance planes. We are ourselves a small country. Last year, we had foreign submarines on our territory. We tried to hit them with bombs. Unfortunately, we did not succeed. We have anxiously asked ourselves if the overflights, etc., are a way to prepare American opinion for an escalation. There remains the possibility that the submarines came from the Soviet Union. Scandinavia was never a hot spot in the Cold War, but it was a point of increasing warmth um, produced by the tensions between the Soviet Union and the Western Bloc. Sweden, as a non-member of NATO, felt vulnerable as a small country. The lingering disquiet of the Swedes could only encourage their increasing identification with another small country, Vietnam. Now, just as Sweden viewed Washington and Moscow with trepidation, so did the North Vietnamese. Um, Chargé d'Affaires Jean-Christophe Oberry, 
knew that a truly unified communist bloc did not exist because he was right on the ground in Hanoi. He had opened the, um, actually the Swedish embassy opened in Hanoi in 1969, and he took over in 1970 as Charge d'Affaires, and then eventually promoted to become the sort of first Swedish ambassador to the Democratic Republic of, North, of, of Vietnam. And Mai Van Bo, the chief of the North Vietnamese Foreign Ministry's political division, proclaimed, we in Hanoi have adopted John Christoph Oberry. And he said that to Oberry, you Swedes have an ability to understand Vietnam that is exceptional for a Western country. I did say you understand Vietnam better than even the French, even though they have been here a long time. There's remarkable experience for us Vietnamese. It is not so easy to understand the reasons for this, but I believe it depends on your prolonged period of peace, your lack of colonial ambitions, your profound democratic development, your sympathy for the weakest members of society, and your feeling of solidarity with other small nations. Now, in Hanoi, um, Ambassador Oberry cultivated an invaluable network of contacts. Um, Soviet personnel stationed there indicated a Russo-Vietnamese split rather than the long-studied Sino-Soviet version. Um, officials at the Soviet embassy insisted that Hanoi had not shared its plans with Moscow for the 1972 Easter Offensive. The Soviets feared that the offensive could not meet with success. Moreover, the Soviets seemed more concerned about their connection to the United States than their friendship with North Vietnam. Um, and when Soviet ships were bombed in Hanoi by accident by the US, Oberry reported to Stockholm, the Soviet attempt to stop a tone down the loss of Soviet lives and property as a result of Sunday's bomb attack against Haiphong must be interpreted as an attempt not to dramatize the consequences of the American bomb attack within the frame for the bilateral relations between Washington and Moscow. It goes without saying that Hanoi is looking worriedly at this. The Soviets were unhappy with Hanoi's aggressive prosecu uh, prosecution of the Easter Offensive and its aggressively outspoken objections to the blockade of North Vietnam's po um, ports. Now, Oberyn knew this because of his contact with his Soviet counterpart in Hanoi. And Oberry again reported to Stockholm, the Soviet ambassador, who has consistently toned down the developing crisis during the past weeks, is now requesting non-communist embassies, the Swedish among them, to use their influence with Hanoi to explain to North Vietnam that they have more to win through negotiations than through further escalation of the fighting in South Vietnam. Another first Swedish diplomat who spent some time in Hanoi was a man named Kai Falkman. And when he visited Hanoi, an official from Hanoi's foreign ministry escorted Falkman to, its, to a historical museum. As the two men viewed old maps of Vietnam, the North Vietnamese official focused on his country's northern border, which had been violated over millennia by quote unquote, northern feudal lords. Falk Falkman was quick to note that the official would only refer to the Chinese as northern feudal lords and nothing else. Um, in the autumn of 1972, Hanoi was subjected to terror from the air. Starting on Friday, October 6th, the United States attacked the North Vietnamese capital with a particular ferocity that did not end until Monday, October 9th. Ambassador Oberry survived a relatively close call on that first day. And he reported to Stockholm. During Friday's raids, an American missile was fired, which is said to be the type known as the Shriek, toward the city center and claimed 26 dead and injured. The missile fell less than 300 meters from the embassy, meaning the Swedish embassy, and hit a residential block. The Shriek was an anti-radiation air to ground missile that deliberately detected and then targeted anti-aircraft radar. Shortly before noon on October 12th, the French diplomatic mission in Hanoi 
did not prove as fortunate as the Swedish embassy had. Even though the French mission was located in a diplomatic area, far from any industrial targets or North Vietnamese government buildings, its residence was all but destroyed in yet another US bombing raid over the North Vietnamese capital. Pierre Suzini, the dele a delegate general, was trapped in the rubble. The Swedish ambassador immediately visited the affected site, even trying to um, dig Suzini out with a shovel with his own hands. A Vietnamese soldier stopped the helmetless Oberry, warning him that the bombing could resume. Um, determined to help in some way, Oberry informed Stockholm via radio of the catastrophe. Quote, the French radio connection was broken off. We were suddenly the only link with Western Europe. As soon as he could, Oberry made available the Swedish embassy's own radio system to the other members of the French delegation. They reached the French embassy in Stockholm. Courtesy of the Swedish embassy in Hanoi, Suzini's deputy could then communicate with his superiors in Paris. The Swedish ambassador closely monitored the condition of the comatose Suzini, who had been a good friend of his. And Suzini bore third degree burns over more than half his body, among other injuries. Against the recommendation of Vietnamese doctors who insisted that Suzini was in no condition to travel, the delegate general was flown back to France several days later for additional medical care. And sadly, Suzini would die on October 19th at a Lyon hospital. Um, initially, Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird and Secretary of State William Rogers attempted to blame North of Vietnamese anti-aircraft missiles for the bombing of the French delegation's residence. Um, wiring Stockholm as Suzini lay dying, the Swedish ambassador bitterly scoffed at Laird's explanation. One could maybe begin by asking Defense Secretary Laird, how come the Vietnamese civil defense immediately after the direct hit found three additional undetonated American bombs in the delegation's vicinity right after the direct hit. One can further ask the American Defense Secretary how he's explaining that an additional building in the delegation's neighborhood was totally destroyed by two American bombs, of which one could be identified. Shortly afterwards, a French investigative commission determined that the bombs did in fact come from the United States. And it was only then that the Americans owned up to their mistake. The Swedish ambassador's humanitarianism was duly acknowledged. French Force Minister um, Maurice Schumann personally thanked the Swedish government for Oberry's aid after the bombing. In spite of the unofficial agreement reached by National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger and North Vietnamese diplomat Le Duc Tho in Paris in December of 1972, uh, Nixon ordered the bombing of the North Vietnamese cities of Hanoi and Haiphong shortly before Christmas, officially known as Linebacker II, since the official, um, the original Linebacker campaign had taken place earlier that year. The so-called Christmas bombings lasted from December 18th to December 27th. A Linebacker, as known by Nixon's fellow football fans, and I mean American football, not soccer, is a playing position Linebacker 2 was mainly a signal to the government in Saigon that the U.S. president would maintain his commitment to the regime after the withdrawal of American troops. 40,000 tons of bombs fell on Hanoi and 15,000 on Haiphong, leaving more than 1,600 people dead. Um, after reading Professor Schwartz's book, I might have to revise those statistics somewhat. Particularly offensive to the Swart, um, to the Swart, to the Swedes, <laughs> and to Paul himself, was that the fact that Bach Mai Hospital in Hanoi had also been hit. The destruction of the hospital was a blow not only for North Vietnam, but for the Swedes as well, for they had contributed a great deal of aid to it. Whether deliberate or not, hospitals were frequently hit in the bombing raids over North Vietnam in 1972. And Bach Mai had also been bombed in June as well. Palma therefore decided to take a stand. He sought the advice of his social democratic counterparts in Austria and West Germany, 
Bruno Kreisky and Billy Brandt, respectively. Both chancellors had close ties to Sweden. Kreisky, an Austrian of Jewish descent and a committed socialist, had spent the Second World War in Stockholm. The German Brandt, an active opponent of the Nazis, had found refuge in Sweden as well as Norway. The social democratic movement in Sweden would also shape Brandt's political development. Brandt probably hated the Vietnam War as much as Palma did. Not only did the West German Chancellor object to the war on moral grounds, he also suspected that the conflict in Southeast Asia would eventually result in an American military evacuation from Europe, which was a terrifying prospect for him. At the same time, Brandt refrained from criticizing the Nixon administration directly. According to the minutes of his telephone conversation with Brandt, Palma said, quote, that the bombings now involve systematic destruction of a country. And Palma ex sincerely expressed the same sentiments in private that he would very soon express in public. The West German Chancellor mentioned that he'd been in touch with General S Secretary Leonid Brezhnev of the Soviet Union, whose reaction to the Christmas bombings was, quote, entirely undramatic, unquote. Understanding Brezhnev's muted response, the Swedish Prime Minister observed that, quote, the Russians clearly were patient and that they also were economically dependent on the USA. Palma suspected that Brezhnev believed that the American war in Vietnam would somehow exculpate any future Soviet intervention in an Eastern European country. As for West Germany, the Swedish Prime Minister proposed that Brandt and French President Georges Pompidou, quote, propose mediation or at least make a public statement, unquote. Um, although the West German government had, actually Brandt had said he was thinking about making an official statement. Um, and Ch the Chance West German Chancellor gave Paula permission to inform Hanoi, <coughs> the Swedish Prime Minister promptly did. So at this point, all Brandt did was say, okay, I might make a statement. Palma also consulted with his mentor and predecessor, former Prime Minister Tager Lander, and with socialist Alva Myrdal, who was the Swedish Minister for Disarmament. Another advisor, Anders Fern, wrote a draft of a speech with the Prime Minister revised in his own words at his own kitchen table at home on the night of December 22nd. As evidence of the Prime Minister's literary contribution, a draft of the speech in Palma's own handwriting is available at the Labor Movement Archive outside of Stockholm. Palma later recounted, it was not an instant reaction. It was building up inside of me since the bombing resumed. We had many discussions on it over a period of five days or so. And then that evening, I knew what I had to say about it. The Prime Minister knew what he had to say, even without the Council of Home Foreign Ministry. It was a completely spontaneous gesture. On December 23rd, Palma recorded a speech that was first broadcast on Swedish radio and then textually transmitted to <coughs> international media. He also gave an encore on film for Swedish television. In this speech, Palma dispensed with his customary tact. He had no fear of offending Washington. We should call things by their proper names, Palma began speaking from the heart. What is going on in Vietnam today is a form of torture. And he said that North Vietnam was no threat to the United States. So Nixon's action had no justification at all. Quote, people are being punished, a nation is being punished in order to humiliate it, to force it to submit to force, unquote. He compared the Christmas bombings to the Jewish Holocaust of World War II, the Nazi German and fascist Italian bombing of the doomed Spanish town of Guernica in 1937, the 1940 Soviet mass execution of Polish officers, and the 1960 massacre of blacks in Sharpeville, South Africa. Palma concluded his speech uh, with a, a roll call of atrocities. Guernica, Oradour, Babi Yar, Katyn, Lidice, Sharpel, Treblinka. Now a new list will be, a new name will be added to the list. Hanoi, Christmas, 1972.
The text of the uh, speech arrived at the Washington Embassy via telex on Saturday, December 23rd. As the officer on duty, First Secretary Jan Eliasson found his holiday weekend disturbed. He said, it wasn't a regular working day. I remember I came to the embassy and it was not open. Once inside, Eliasson examined the telex and concluded, this is dialect. Although the reaction from the Nixon administration would come that same day, um, telegrams uh, from the Swedish embassy in Hanoi gave the prime minister no reason to regret what he had said. Charge d'Affaires Eskil Lundberg reported that the bombing raids on December 19th and 22nd that had struck Bach my hospital had killed one surgeon, 15 nurses, one pharmacist, and six medical students. Three buildings in the medical complex, including the central laboratory, were damaged. With the rest of the local diplomatic corps, Lundberg soon inspected the damage for himself, which turned out to be even worse than expected. Quote, one conclude that the material damage with regard to the buildings is now total, unquote. Uh, ambassador Oberry uh, visited the site, and according to the ambassador, the casualty toll was even higher now, with 30 people dead, including five doctors. Now, after this speech was made, the U.S. president, who could never handle criticism with good grace, was very angry. Um, it's true that Western Europeans as a whole can criticize the bombing, but they didn't exactly condemn the bombings. The chancellor of West Germany privately described the Christmas bombings as, quote, disgusting and unfathomable, unquote. But for all the encouragement he had given Palmer, Grant maintained public silence. And um, I found no evidence that the German government expressed any private reservations to Washington about the bombings. West Germany was even more dependent on the good graces of the United States than the Soviet Union was. A spokesman for Brunt merely lamented the lack of a peace agreement in Vietnam, indicating the wish that peace talks would, quote, soon achieve results, unquote. Not that Palma blamed Brunt for his cautious approach, as veteran Swedish diplomat Rolf Ikeas noted, quote, Will, Billy Brock became so important for Sweden and for Palma to the end of his life. I think Brock made clear to Palma that we, West Germany, cannot be, so to say, not be loyal to the United States. We have the Soviet Union, we have East Germany, we have these crazy guys. So one can understand, it was just like a rational fear. I even participated in conversations with Brock Palma. One had to be very careful. Palma was very, very smart. He understood it absolutely, absolutely. Um, Sweden, um, Austria, like Sweden, was also a non-member of NATO, but I couldn't make, find any evidence that Bruno Kreisky had made a, a public statement about the bombings. Yet Sweden had a far older tradition of neutrality than Austria did. Um, Sweden had fought a war since 1814. Therefore, the Prime Minister of Sweden felt uh, freer to speak his mind. Palma's comments stood apart in their comparison of the Christmas bombings to Nazi atrocities. In World War II, one should remember, uh, Nixon had served as a naval lieutenant in the Pacific Theater. Even though the former logistics officer had faced little danger, and only from the Japanese, the American president found the comparison to the Nazis impossible to stomach. Kissinger reported that Palma's reference to the Third Reich was a, quote, aching wisdom tooth, unquote, for the president. Although my evidence is circumstantial, I would suggest that the prime minister's words inflicted an even sharper toothache in the mouth of the national security advisor. Nixon had spent much of the Second World War in the South Pacific, but Kissinger, a member of a German-Jewish family, had suffered from direct contact with the Nazi menace. In 1938, he fled with his immediate family to the United States. Thirteen relatives who had remained behind perished in the Holocaust. During World War II, the young refugee then returned to his homeland as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. 
And Kissinger later said, quote, consciousness that societies can take a very evil turn. This separates me from many Americans who have never seen it, can't imagine it, unquote. Now, Kissinger could easily have included the Swedes in this statement. As Kissinger saw it, Palmer knew nothing of evil. He did. The overly sensitive Nixon and Kissinger should have realized that the best way to avoid comparisons to Nazis would have been to refrain from committing atrocities themselves. But, observed this esteemed historian, Robert Dalek, Kissinger resented all the criticism directed at him, unquote, no matter the reason. Um, immediately after Palma's speech, and on the same day, U.S. Secretary of State for Political Affairs, U. Alexis Johnson, ironically a Swedish American, requested the appearance of Ambassador Debesh. Hubert Debesh was the Swedish ambassador to Washington, to the State Department in Washington at noon, functioning as acting Secretary of State since everybody else was on vacation. Johnson made a statement to the Swedish ambassador that was authorized from the highest level, quote, I am acting on direct personal instructions of the president. Let me say first that personally, I cannot recall any case of two states with diplomatic and friendly relations where the chief of government of one state made such outrageous statements with regard to the government of the other state. I cannot recall any statement made by the Swedish government about Nazi Germany, same as what is now said in regard to the US. The president feels that given the Swedish government's relations with Nazi Germany and what he feels was the cooperation, that statement comes with singular ill grace. Obviously, Palma had borne no official responsibility for Sweden's provision of iron ore to Nazi Germany or the permitted use of its territory for the transport of German troops to and from occupied Norway. Nixon, on the other hand, did bear direct responsibility for his own policy in Southeast Asia. Therefore, in my opinion, Nixon's comment about Nazi Germany was the one that came with singular ill grace. But Under Secretary Johnson went on, quote, the U.S. government, therefore, cannot come to any other conclusion that the Swedish government attaches very little importance or value to its relations with the U.S. or the attitude of the U.S. government towards Sweden. In consequence hereof, the charge d'affaires, John Guthrie, who is now in the U.S., will not be returning to Sweden. It is further the view of the U.S. government that it would not be useful for the successor for Ambassador de Besch, who has already got agreement to come to the U.S. at this time, unquote. So in the molar, de Besch's newly appointed replacement would not be received in Washington, and John Guthrie, who had just come home for Christmas, would remain in the United States. Furthermore, U.S. Ambassador Jerome Holland had left Stockholm in August, and Washington would not replace him anytime soon. Debesh was understandably incensed, and he said, I terminated the conversation by concluding that in the USA, one found Palma's statement outrageous. In Sweden, one found the American bombing outrageous. So Stockholm and Washington would not uh, reestablish full diplomatic relations at the ambassadorial level for more than a year. In spite of these tensions, it would be a mistake to label the Palma government as anti-American. It was far more pro-American than publicly understood at the time. Sweden did consciously and deliberately engage in military collaboration with the United States. Many critics of US foreign policy must be sorely disappointed by this fact. In spite of this collaboration, Stockholm avoided collaboration with NATO. Since NATO was a US doc, um, doc, um, dominated organization, what difference, you may ask, did it make for Sweden to just cooperate with America alone? As an explanation, Rolf Achaeus referred to nine, um, Kissinger's 1975 advocacy of the Nordic balance. And effectively, um, 
Actually, Kissinger didn't advocate the Nordic balance. What do I think? Ikea is referring to the Nordic balance. And Ikea said that neutral Sweden effectively functioned as a, a buffer zone between the Eastern and Western blocks. Um, and um, Kissinger later did advocate the importance of a buffer zone in Northern Europe when he was considering the crisis in Ukraine. And the former Secretary of State wrote in 2014, quote, far too often the Ukrainian issue is posed as a showdown whether Ukraine joins the East or West. But if Ukraine is to survive and thrive, it must not be either side's outpost against the other. It should function as a bridge between them, unquote. So therefore, the former Secretary of State advised Ukraine from seeking official membership in NATO. Internationally, Kissinger wrote, they should pursue a posture comparable to that of Finland. The nation leaves no doubt about its fierce independence and cooperates with the West in most fields, but carefully avoids uh, institutional hostility toward Russia, unquote. Now, while the case was critical of Kissinger, he also believed that the retired American diplomat's thesis was relevant to the rest of Northern Europe. And Ikea said, we should not build a sharp line between NATO and Russia up there, which would totally change the security structure in Europe. And that was, of course, American policy during that time and our policy also. We should not increase the tension. That also meant that Sweden couldn't be a base, shouldn't be a base for attacks on the Soviet Union, now Russia. So I think that this is a policy which is a contribution to the stability and peace in Northern Europe. It would be a real serious undermining of European security if we, maybe with the Finns, start to build up a major front, a new front towards Russia. During the Cold War, official Swedish neutrality not only provided Northern Europe with a secure buffer zone, it allowed Stockholm greater independence of action in other international matters. Neutral Sweden was not a polite fiction, but something that existed in reality. Regardless of Sweden's friendship with the United States, the Scandinavian country did not feel obligated to consult with the members of the North Atlantic Alliance before acting. From time to time, the Swedes could even challenge the superpower itself, as they did over the war in Vietnam. Thank you. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the domestic political implications in Sweden of this policy. Was Palmer uh, to some extent driving public opinion on the war, or was he reflecting it? And was there any kind of backlash given just how uh, pronounced his remarks were at, at times? Well, I think he was pushed by popular opinion, and he also pushed popular opinion. Um, in the late 60s, there was concern that the extreme left would attract young people at the expense of the Social Democratic Party. So I, I believe the Social Democrats found it to their advantage to speak out against the Vietnam War. But even um, before Palma entered politics, even when he was an intelligence officer in the Swedish um, army, he would write reports about Indochina expressing profound concern about um, conditions there. So he was he had, he was concerned about it even before it was to his political advantage to be concerned. And by the time Palma made his uh, speech in uh, 1972, all five uh, leaders, including Palma, of the Swedish political parties from right to left endorsed his views and condemned the bombings and sent a statement to UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim. Yes. Um, two, two related questions. When he came in June of 1970, mm -hmm. did he meet with Nixon at that time and what did they talk about? The second question is how well known was the secret collaboration between the US and Sweden and the general uh, public's knowledge of what was going on? Okay, so in June of 1970, um, he came officially to accept an honorary doctorate from Kenyon College in Ohio. He had gotten a bachelor's degree there in 1948. 
And he said, it's not an official visit. I'm just getting my dog doctor through. But um, the Swedish Foreign Ministry was sending hints to the White House saying that an invitation would be welcome. But um, he was not invited to the White House. And what's indicative of his Palmer status in Washington, that the, only, the highest official who would receive him was Secretary of State William Rogers. Anyway, yeah. uh, the Swedish people did not know about this military collaboration. It, it came to light after Palmer's death. So as far as the Swedish people knew, Sweden was 100% neutral. And it was a policy of the elite policymakers who were pursuing this program of the collaboration. Oh, but I, I should say something. Remember when um, I gave my paper for the AHA panel and, and you had asked me, um, was there any um, evidence of uh, Swedish espion espionage via the submarines? Um, and I mentioned that in the early 1970s, relations between the, uh, Sweden and the Soviet Union were relatively harmonious. Um, actually, the same month that Palma visited Washington, he also visited Moscow. But things became really tense between Sweden and the Soviet Union in the early 1980s during Palma's second term when the, the submarines were sighted once again. Uh, Palma had any links with the uh... Third World Not Aligned Movement, and uh, how did he see his stance in relation to the superpowers? Um, did he see a link with uh, like the Not Aligned Movement above the uh, Third World? Um, I think he became, when he became Prime Minister in 1969, um, Vietnam almost absorbed all his attention as foreign policy was concerned. But he was later became, after the Vietnam War ended, he was a leading figure in, so, in, the, in the Socialist International. And he was um, highly supportive of liberation struggles in Angola and South Africa. He also visited Cuba, which of course was not on, you know, which was of course aligned. But he, he, had a, he supported third world movements in general, whether aligned or not aligned. Do you have a theory on whether his politics had a role to play in this assassination? Yes. Um, when I gave a talk two years ago, someone asked me, well, you know, who do you think killed Paul? And I said, yeah, that case will never be solved. But I was proven I mean, wrong. We could have a conference just on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think a conference devoted to his assassination would be like digging a bottomless pit. But I think. Um, a journalist around 2018, a Swedish journalist, um, fingered a man named Stig Engström, who, who, worked, who was a graphic artist who worked for an insurance company in Stockholm near the site of the assassination. I can't really go into it um, in detail, but I thought he made a convincing case. And then a Swedish prosecutor um, a year or so later concluded that the it, that he was also the, the leading suspect and concluded that he was the assassin. And watching um, footage, old footage of Stig Engstrom in documentaries where he claimed to be a witness, um, confirmed my suspicions. He, there was just something fishy about him, and everything he said just contradicted the available facts in contrast to other witnesses. So um, just as um, Lee Harvey Oswald killed JFK, and I don't think there was a conspiracy, because he was a left-wing loser who wanted to distinguish himself in some way, I think Stig, Stig Engstrom was a right-wing loser who wasn't an important person, but also sought fame for himself. Thank you. Why do you think they botched the investigation? Why do you think the Swedish police are, uh, that, you know, I mean, yeah, he was obviously known at the time. I, I think that um, the police were not equipped to deal with crimes of, of such a great scale. I mean, this wasn't the United States. This wasn't New York City. Things like this didn't happen in Stockholm, which is why it was 
a um, such a tremendous shock. I mean, the, the last Swedish leader to be assassinated before Palmer was G King Gustav III in the 18th century. <laughs> and the United States has had four assassinations in say 100, 150 years. And many more attempts. Mm -hmm. So I'll introduce Dr. Pierre Asselin. He completed his doctorate in history at the University of Hawaii. The author of three monographs, Dr. Asselin is now professor of history and Dwight E. Sanford chair in US foreign relations at San Diego State University. Don't mind the drilling outside. His first book, A Bitter Peace, Washington, Hanoi, and the Making of the Paris Agreement, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2002. A North Vietnamese language version of A Bitter Peace came out in 2005. His most recent monograph is America, Vietnam's American War, A History, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. 2018. At present, he is working on the Cambridge History of the Vietnam War, Volume 3, Endings, with his co-editor, Lin Hong Nguyen. Dr. Asselin has contributed articles to peer-reviewed journals such as Diplomatic History, the Journal of Cold War Studies, Cold War History, and the Journal of American East Asian Relations. Now he will present his paper, Manipulating American Friends to Defeat American Enemies, Hanoi's Visitor Diplomacy in the Vietnam War. Dr. Eslin, the floor is virtually yours. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for putting this, this great conference together. Um, I've, I've had to miss most of the presentations because, because uh, it, it's basically in the middle of my night. Um, but I, I, I look forward to reading the papers uh, that, that, that the participants have, have, have put together. Um, so, so this is a, a kind of something I've been working on for for the for for the last year or so. Um, you know, I've been intrigued for a while uh, by by those 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 American travelers slash visitors who went to North Vietnam during during the war. Um, I, I think that you know you're probably all um, aware that 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 Jane Fonda made a very very controversial visit to Northern Vietnam in 1972 during which she sat, uh, as you can see here, on, on an anti-aircraft gun, um, a gun used to shoot down American warplanes. Um, uh, Fonda herself uh, would go on to regret her, her decision to have, to have done that. Um, she, she, she was always kind of a, a proud anti-warrior, uh, but, but subsequently uh, recognized that perhaps she'd gone too far uh, by 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 posing for this 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 picture, uh, but then but then she she also would would wonder um, quote uh, it is possible that this was a setup that the Vietnamese had it all planned I will I will never know um, and and as it turns out and as I'm going to argue through this paper. Uh, Fonda was indeed, indeed set up as, as she uh, would intimate um, years after, after the fact. Uh, the, the North Vietnamese authorities did in fact um, go out of their way to, to exploit, to manipulate the passion, the idealism, the ardent anti-militarism, and occasionally the sheer naivete of, of the Americans who came to North Vietnam during, during the war. Um, essentially, what I'm, I'm going to demonstrate through this paper, which is based on files um, I uncovered in the Vietnamese archives, is that, is that hosting these Americans um, was, was part of a very, very carefully calculated strategy uh, developed by, by, by the, the, the North Vietnamese authorities. And some of the documents I'll share with, with you today will, will kind of give you an idea of, of just how meticulous the process was as far as Hanoi was concerned. And, and to me, it's interesting because it, it goes to agency, right? Uh, some people have written about those visits, and, and, but they've always focused on, on the Americans themselves, right? And how brave and courageous they were to go there to basically kind of, you know, save the, the Vietnamese from, 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 from American policymakers. 
but but what I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of demonstrate in that paper is that the real agency here was with the 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 the, the northern Vietnamese. They were the ones who made these visits visits happen, and specifically, they were the ones who very very carefully selected who was coming to North Vietnam and what they would see during their their visit, their stay in 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 North in North Vietnam. Uh, I love that word. Uh, a lot of people who write about the Americans, the, the U.S. citizens who went to northern Vietnam during the war, call them travelers. Uh, and that's so, So you know, I, I I'm, I'm, will we'll use that word. Uh, and then I'm, I'm certainly open to suggestions uh, when we when we when we when we uh, have our, our Q&A session. But but essentially um, uh, over 300 Americans went to to North Vietnam during the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1973. Um, it, 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 we have small numbers in 65, 66, and then, and then a, a pretty large contingent of nearly 40 people who go in 67. Uh, and all of this is basically meant to coincide uh, with, with certain policies and tactics pursued by the regime in, in, in Hanoi. Uh, but, but, but almost invariably, the Americans who go to northern Vietnam, they're, they're committed pacifists. Um, who, who are kind of staunchly opposed to America's war in Vietnam, and at the same time feel very, very sympathetic to, 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 to those Vietnamese resisting the United States. Uh, they are, for the most part, students, they're academics, they're, they're college professors, uh, they're social activists. Uh, there's a good number of lawyers, there's a handful of veterans, uh, there's a number of religious leaders, uh, and then there's a fair amount of artists. Uh, and in the words of one of them, um, uh, most of these guys are people who don't need any convincing. Uh, they're, they're, they're really going to kind of confirm what they already feel and believe about the American war in Vietnam, and, and Hanoi will fully indulge them, as I'm going to demonstrate in, in, in a moment. Uh, there's a handful of, of accredited journalists and news photographers who go in, but again, uh, those guys are selected by Hanoi because Hanoi has a sense that they can be... Um, uh, impressed by what they see. They, they are impressionable. Uh, so so uh, some of you might know that, that one of the most famous journalists to go to northern Vietnam was Alison Salisbury. Uh, and sure enough, uh, uh, Hanoi uh, specifically chose him because it got the sense from his writings before he came to Vietnam that this was an individual who could somehow be persuaded to write more favorably about, about, about the northern Vietnamese, which, which he absolutely did in the aftermath of his, of his visit. Uh, now, when, when you read the accounts of these Americans who go, um, and, and this gives you an idea of why, you know, it, it was somewhat easy for Hanoi to manipulate them and ultimately get them to write what they wanted them to write. Uh, they, they, they talk about going to North Vietnam on fact-finding missions. Um, uh, they, they, they talk about going there to comprehend the totality of an Asian existence unfolding in a world of primitive drama. Uh, they talk about saving these thin bone people who inhabit this backward country. And, and they talk about serving a sacred purpose, right? So, so, so you, you see, right, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're committed to doing good. And there's no question that what they're doing was, was extremely noble. But their perception of the Vietnamese uh, is, is, is not necessarily particularly flattering, although from their own standpoint, right, uh, they're, they're merely trying to do right uh, by a people who basically are too weak, too poor, too disorganized, too primitive to do right for themselves. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and that's one of the elements that, that Hanoi is going to exploit to its, to its advantage. Hanoi is going to play on, on, on these, uh, you know, the, these particular perceptions of, of, of the Vietnamese embraced by these 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 American these American visitors. Now you know most of these guys enter North Vietnam, you know, thinking that you know, of course, of course, they're allowed to be here because they're good people. But it turns out that 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 every visitor goes through a very very rigorous process, uh, and it's it's really only those individuals who Manoy believes stand to deliver the most dividends after their visit. Who make it into into northern Vietnam? So so you know, looking at the files, and again, I'm going to show you what they look like. Uh, it, it 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 have established that there's really kind of four criteria uh, 
Hanoi looks for before granting access to Northern Vietnam to American visitors. Uh, the first is, is that you, you have to be a prominent voice either you know, in the anti-war movement or in some progressive organization like, like, like you know, Women's Strike for Peace or, or the Civil Rights Movement. So, so, so you have to have prominence. The second, the second criterion, you have to be easily impressionable. You have to basically already espouse favorable views of Hanoi uh, and of the National Liberation Front, which, which, which invariably, again, except for a handful of journalists, uh, all of these guys uh, um, um, uh, embraced. Um, you have to have a record of publicly um, and, and, and somewhat efficiently condemning the criminal conduct of American policymakers in, in, in Southeast Asia. And then finally, you have to show promise, you have to demonstrate promise of, 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 of doing the same thing, but even more ardently upon your return from, from, from Northern Vietnam. Um, I, one of the documents is, I mean, it, it, it's incredible just, just how meticulous Hanoi is. Uh, I, one of the professors, uh, there's a professor who, who wants to go to, 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 North, to Northern Vietnam and he, he, he petitions for, for a visa. And, and basically Hanoi goes through the number of classes he's been teaching the last two years, how many students he has in each class and how many students he's gonna have in the future. And, and it's, it's all meant to basically, you know, calculate whether or not this particular individual is worthy of coming to Northern Vietnam and be exposed to um, this tour that I'm going to talk about in, 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 in a moment. What's very, very interesting is that Hanoi makes very special allowances for women, for African Americans, and for religious activists. Um, and, and again, it's all by design, right? Because they know that, that, that the number of women are already fighting for for, for, for uh, basically female emancipation, right? They know African-Americans are already involved in the civil rights movement. And they know that certain religious activists are already involved in a variety of different causes, right? They have broad audiences. And, 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 and if they come to Northern Vietnam, not only can they then talk to the anti-war movement, but they can also talk to uh, uh, women in Women's Strike for Peace. They can also talk to to African Americans who are members of the Black Panther Party, for example, uh, or they, they can they can they can talk to certain religious denominations, and and the Quakers were, were particularly big in that in that respect. But but again, right? It's 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 it, all of this is very very calculated. And I'll I'll show you a a, a, a document in a moment. Uh, this is from one of those documents. Uh, it's a 1966 assessment by the Central Committee of the Vietnam Women's Association. Uh, about 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 hosting a, a delegation of U.S. women. So so by 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 previous arrangements, uh, Hanoi is about to welcome six American women, um, and and the Americans have told Hanoi that they're not sure exactly who's going to go. Uh, and and as Hanoi contemplates all of this, this, this is what this is what Hanoi writes. The composition of the delegation is very important. It's necessary to choose progressive women actively working for Vietnam, well known in the struggle movement in the United States. The members who come to Vietnam would ideally be youth and black Americans, right? People who are already involved in the youth and black, the civil rights movement, because they could be easily conditioned to act on our behalf. And this is a sample of, 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 of the kinds of discussions Hanoi is having with itself. As it as it as it contemplates who gets to come and who 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 doesn't make it. Here are some of the documents, right? So so every visitor who wants to go to northern Vietnam basically has a file um, and and is very very carefully studied and vetted. So this is Dave Dellinger, right? Very very famous anti-war activist. Um, Dellinger goes to northern Vietnam on a number of occasions, and each time he comes, he gets vetted again, right? So, 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 so here, right, uh, so this, this document essentially explains who Dellinger is, what he's been doing for Vietnam, uh, how long he wants to come, uh, and, then, and then it's basically, okay, whether or not we should allow him in, uh, uh, how long we should allow him to come, whether or not we should pay for his visit, uh, 
uh, and then and then and then and then and then conceivably exactly where he's going to go, what he's going to see, who he's going to 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 meet. Um, but but uh, you know, so so here, for example, they talk about okay, we're, you know, Dellinger's been a good friend. He's already been here before. This time, when when he comes, uh, we're going to show him like the, the the spirit of our people to fight while producing. So so they're going to make him tour not only bombed out areas but also factories. Uh, and then and then and then the idea is that we're going to help him understand even better uh, the 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 that kind of the the, the, the criminal aggressive policies of of the American of the American government. But this is this is a pretty cool one. These are two Quakers who want to go, Russell Johnson and Paul Johnson, there's no relations as far as Hanoi is concerned, who want to come and visit Northern Vietnam in 66. And this is so interesting, right? Because at this point, Hanoi doesn't really know who the Quakers are, right? So, so, so the document basically says, well, they're members of a religious organization. And we don't like that because, you know, again, right, as Marxist-Leninists, they don't, they don't like religion. But then they go on to say that, well, actually, Norman Morrison, who some of you know, right, committed self-immolation in 65, was a Quaker. And so based on that, Hanoi thinks, you know, Morrison was a Quaker. These guys are Quakers. Well, maybe, maybe this would be a good thing. Also, they talk about the fact that the Quakers have just issued a statement a public statement in the United States uh, uh, condemning uh, uh, the bombing of Northern Vietnam. And, and so, so, so the document says, you know, this is kind of a good thing for us. Uh, and then they, they talk about Russell Johnson, right? That he's a very, very important person uh, in the Quaker movement. And then, and then also that, that Dellinger vouches for him. Like they, 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 when Dellinger is in Vietnam, I know we'll ask Dellinger his thoughts on, 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 on Johnson. And then, and then, and then, basically, Dellinger will tell them that you know Russell is, is a very, very important, is the most important person, one of the most important person inside the Quakers. Uh, and then, and then, uh, uh, you know, and then, and then this, I love this this paragraph here. And then they say Hanoi basically says, you know, Russell Johnson, he's not really in the mold of the people we would normally invite, right? He's not, you know, we, we would normally would not invite him, but but it turns out that. You know, and here they say, we need to elevate our propaganda in the United States, right? We need to increase our propaganda activities in, in the United States. And so, so because of that, Johnson and the Quakers can help us in that, in that respect. And then, and then they say, as far as the other guy, the other Paul Johnson, the other guy is, is concerned. Well, you know, we don't really know him well. And then, you know, Russell Johnson is probably going to do anything anyway. So we're not going to give him a, a visa, right? So, so, you, so you see, right? It's, it's like, so, so we already have one guy. He's more famous than the other. So we'll bring that guy. But we're not going to bring the, 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 the other guy. Uh, this, is, this is the Robert Williams file. Some of you might know uh, Robert F. Williams was a radical African-American activist, uh, eventually accused of murder. He seeks asylum in Cuba. He ends up living in Cuba for a while. And then he moves to China, but in the midst of that, he visits he visits northern Vietnam, and and then you know he goes for the first time in '64, and then he wants to go back in '66, uh, and then and then it's, it's it's very you know and so so the file here I, I don't want to get into into it, but, but basically it says that you know we 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 like we like this guy because he's a person who's got black skin, he is a person of black skin, and he and his wife have been here before. They were they were they were kind of good people. And then they would, they, would, they, would, they would really help us with our propaganda inside the United States, especially among the masses with, with, with black skin. Um, so, so, so they're specifically targeting African-Americans and they think that Williams will help that, will help Hanoi kind of you know, mobilize the African-American support against the war in, in Vietnam. Um, and then, and then you know, and, and then it kind of it kind of goes on from from there. But you see, right? They, they, they you know, they, 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 you know, we we often, you know, the, the visitors themselves think of the North Vietnamese as primitive, right? And and when we teach about 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 Vietnam or North Vietnam, you know, we always think of of our, you know, some of our colleagues who teach this stuff, or some of our students think of, you know, all these poor backward peasants, right? And, and, you know, they, they, they were just out there farming the fields and then the big bad Americans came in. But, but what's really remarkable is the extent of the sophistication 
um, of, 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 of the leadership on the other side and how, and the, 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 the truly remarkable awareness of conditions in the United States and, and, and internationally. Um, and, you know, it, in terms of the outcome of the war, when you realize how informed Hanoi was about what's happening in the United States, it's really not surprising that, that they won the war uh, uh, in, 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 in the end. Hanoi had, a, had such a, a better, under, a, 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 an understanding of America that was so much better than the understanding of Northern Vietnam that uh, American policymakers had. Um, this is that document about the six women. Uh, so, so, so we're gonna host uh, a, a delegation of, of uh, American women uh, of six people. And this is where they basically explain what kind of people they should be bringing into, 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 into Vietnam. Now, uh, depending on the time these guys come, right? Um, Hanoi is going to customize a tour for them. But it turns out that, let's say, you know, depending on when you're going, uh, you know, you, you're, you're going to be told that, that you know, you, you're, you're taken on a special tour, you know, just for you because you're a good friend. But, but if, if, if you come during a particular time, basically you're getting the same tour that the other people coming around your, your, your period are, are getting. Uh, you get the same interpreters, you stay at the same hotel, you go to the same sites, and then, and then this is the great thing. You hear the same stories from the same people. Uh, you talk to the same Catholic bishop, uh, you always talk to a monk, and then the bishop and the monk basically tell you the same thing, how free religion is in Vietnam and how supportive Hanoi is of the Catholic church on the one hand, and then the Buddhist church on the other. Uh, they all get to meet Pham Van Dung, uh, who tells them that, you know, oh, we only want peace, we love peace, all we want is peace. And who also tells them that the Viet Cong in the South is independent. And then if they're only if they're important enough, uh, if they're a big shot, then they get to meet, to meet Ho Chi Minh, and then they get to have uh, a, a sit down with American POWs. But, 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 but Ho Chi Minh is really reserved for, for the, 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 the the, the, the bigger names who come to, 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 to Vietnam. So for example, right, if you come to Vietnam in 66, 67 as an American, you stay at the Grand Metropole Hotel, the Tam Nhat Hotel, which is now again the Metropole Hotel. Uh, you're gonna visit uh, either the Revolution or the Army Museum. Uh, and, and, and there you're giving this whole spiel about how the Vietnamese have always fought external aggressors, how for 2,000 years, people have tried to, uh, to, to invade Vietnam, but then for 2,000 years, whenever that happened, the Vietnamese would rise as one nation to defeat, to defeat the invader. So, so that, that whole, you know, that, that whole myth of this indomitable spirit of Vietnamese resistance to foreign aggression, that's where it's communicated. Uh, then, then they go and they visit the offices of the U.S. War Crimes Commission, uh, where they're shown all this evidence of American war crimes. And by the way, this is the only place uh, that on, on, on the tour where, where you're served alcohol. Uh, they, these guys have beer. Uh, the other places serve you tea. The War Crimes Commission serves you beer. Uh, you visit Nam Dinh and Phu Lee which were very heavily bombed. And I'll tell you more about that. And then before you leave, you get a free pair of customized Ho Chi Minh sandals made from uh, old tires. Uh, so, so and, and it's funny because when you read the accounts, right? When you read these accounts by the visitors, uh, each thinks that, oh my God, you know, they gave me a pair of sandals, right? And then they gave me this exclusive interview with a Catholic bishop. And then they gave me this exclusive tour of, of Nam Dinh. But then, but then when you read all of their accounts, you realize that, you know, unbeknownst to them, they're getting what the people who were there the week before are getting. They're seeing what the people who were there the week before are seeing. But, but everything is meant to make them feel special and unique when the reality is that those tours are, are, are customized. Uh, and then, and then, and yeah, and, and the Nam Dinh fully, uh, that's, that's basically, you know, inevitable. And I'll, I'll tell you why in, 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 in a moment. And, and essentially the tours, uh, and they're, they're somewhere usually between seven and 10 days. 
at the limit 10 days. They're, they're really intended to generate maximal sympathy for the just struggle of the Vietnamese and maximal anger toward the policies and actions of, US, of the US government. The emphasis is on, on the one hand, on the destructiveness of, 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 of US bombs, and on the other, they're on the popular enthusiasm for the war, for communism, and for the party state. Uh, this is such a great quote. Uh, this, this is in a document I found in the archives. This is, this is a, a foreign minister and Politburo member Nguyen Zui Ching. Many American representatives who visited our country during the period of the war loved listening to us when we presented war crimes. Point blank, he says, they loved it. They loved it when, 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 when we presented war crimes, right? They, they weren't, he didn't say, you know, oh, they were distraught, they loved it. And sure enough, that's why those guys were there, right? They were coming to see the devastation uh, resulting from, from the bombing. And Hanoi was well aware of that. Uh, and and, and it, 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 it gave them what they were there to see. Um, and, and so, but I, I really, did, you know, I, I love this. They love listening to our, 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 our stories, right? Uh, now, this is very interesting. Uh, all interactions, including interactions with average Vietnamese, are, are basically scripted or else they're filtered through, through interpreters. Um, uh, you know, everywhere they, they go, uh, Americans are told that they'll get a chance to talk to average Vietnamese, right? But then, but then when you read the accounts, clearly those weren't average Vietnamese because, because what the Vietnamese are telling them is, you know, how they're not afraid of U.S. bombs, how they love their government, how they have freedom of speech. If they don't like something, they can just tell the authorities and the changes will be made, how they, they have too much food and so on and so forth. Everything is, is, is scripted. And then, and then, and then, and then it looks at times that they do kind of go off script and then, you know, they do talk to, to passerbys. But then what, 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 I, what, I, what I've realized is that, is that no one speaks Vietnamese, right? So they all have to talk to, through interpreters. And these interpreters are, are ranking members of the party. And so, 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 so even if somebody says, you know, we, we, we hate our lives, life is bad, the interpreter, who's a, who's a kind of a very highly qualified party cadre, will then translate what's being said as, oh, what this person is saying is how much they hate the Americans, how much they love the, love the government, and so on and so forth, right? So, 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 so the inability of, 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 of Americans to engage the Vietnamese without interpreters meant that everything was filtered by, by the interpreters. And, 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 and the visitors themselves basically are never left alone. Now, they, they get to walk. So, so they all stay at the Metropole Hotel in 66, 67, right? So, so they, 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 they are allowed to take short walks around the hotel. Uh, but, but, then, but then, you know, some of them speak French, right? Some of them speak French, which they think they can use. But as it turns out, by, by the time of the war, pretty much, you know, anyone who, who speaks French in Hanoi uh, either works for the government and, and, and knows that they can't talk to foreigners or else they've been, they've been evacuated from the city because, because of their older age, uh, or else they've been forced out of the city. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but after, after 54, after 1954, after uh, uh, the communists took over Northern Vietnam and Hanoi, uh, they, 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 uh, they basically brought into Hanoi uh, a lot of the revolutionaries from the countries that had fought with them. Uh, and then the old Hanoi elite um, was 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 basically driven out of the city, driven out of Hanoi. Only a handful of families stayed, uh, but 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 Hanoi was effectively populated after '54 by by people from the countryside, um, namely people who basically served the revolution since '45, '46, veterans of Dien Bien Phu, and so on and so forth. So, so it, it, that, that's why, you know, the old Hanoi families will tell you how rude people in Hanoi are, how, you know, they, they spit a lot and they allow their kids to defecate on the streets. But, but that's, that, that's, that's partially because the city of Hanoi after 54 is basically repopulated 
by people from the countryside. And then, and then, and then they know that the, 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 the old Hanoi elite um, was, 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 was for all intents and purposes forced out. So even if you spoke French, uh, it was impossible to find people to talk to about what was really happening in Vietnam. Uh, and then, and then, and then uh, one of the things that Hanoi was very good at was hiding basically fundamental realities of life in Northern Vietnam. Um, uh, life was really, really hard for, for the people of North Vietnam. You know, between what the Americans were doing, which is, which is bombing quite, quite heavily, and the draconian measures in place to, to facilitate mass mobilization and military conscription, life was very, very hard for, for people. But all of this was hidden from view. And also, and also when, 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 when Hanoi, when Pham Van Dong would meet with Americans, he never used communist jargon. He never talked about communism. He only talked about patriotism, about nationalism. So a lot of the Americans who went were left with the impression that, oh, those guys aren't communists. They're nationalists, right? Because they, they, they would never, ever use the jargon with the visitors that they used amongst themselves. They never talked about land reform. They never talked about collectivization. And, and, and they completely uh, hid from the Americans the fact that Northern Vietnam at the, at the height of the war was quintessentially uh, a totalitarian police state. All of that was never seen by, 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 by American visitors. And, then, and, then, and, this, and this is the, the, the part that, that I love. Hanoi always, always downplayed its own resourcefulness and its confidence in its ability to win. You know, when, when, when Americans would tell their Vietnamese handlers that, you know, they're here because, you know, I, I want to understand your primitive country. The, the handlers would basically pander to these ideas by, by telling them, yes, how poor we are, how ignorant we are, how primitive we are, and so on and so forth, right? When, 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 when in fact, you know, I mean, the, the, the armies, for example, uh, fielded by, by the North are, are equipped with some of the most modern weaponry coming from China and the Soviet Union, when in fact, uh, their diplomats overseas uh, are engaging in high-level talks with counterparts and amassing this, this, this incredible amount of information about, 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 about the external world, including the United States. Um, and, and so, so, you know, and, and Hanoi, the leadership was always very confident in the fact that in the end they would prevail, but, but with the visitors, the line was always, oh, you know, we, we know we surely will lose, but if you can help us, maybe, maybe, you know, we will at least survive without losing all of our population. They, they, they always adjust their rhetoric. They always adjust their, their, um, their language to, to basically accommodate and indulge. The, the people they're, 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 they're dealing with. So, so as I was telling you, right, uh, so, fr so they, most of their city are in Hanoi, but then, but then they'll take a day trip, and on the day trip, they'll go to Fuli, and they'll go to Nam Dinh. Uh, and, 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 and they go there to witness the, the effects of, of, of the bombing. Uh, but, but what's really interesting is this. Uh, so this is this is a CIA document, right? And 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 the CIA will basically acknowledge that in the small town of Fuli, about eighty percent of the residential area has been destroyed or damaged by mid nineteen sixty seven. So so high farm the average right the the U.S. bombing of northern Vietnam during the war usually destroys about ten to fifteen percent of residential areas. But in, in terms of fully, the Americans themselves acknowledged that that 80 percent of, of, of the city was was destroyed. And that's the that's the city that's on the itinerary of pretty much every American who comes to Vietnam in 66, 67 and, and 68. And then and then and then what the authorities will do is they'll show fully right, right where the damage is exceptional. And they'll basically tell uh, the Americans that what you see is fully is, is the reality all over Northern Vietnam. And, and when Americans ask to go see other places, the answer is always the same. 
okay, we'll, we'll take you tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, and then, and then again, the answer is the same. We cannot take you because the Americans are bombing there right now. And so, so, so the, the, the bombing also served as justification to not show certain sites that the visitors themselves wanted to see. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's the, so fully an ending, uh, uh, you, you're looking at about most of the town destroyed by U.S. bombs, and that's what's shown to, to the visitors. Uh, so, and, and as you can imagine, right, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, this is on American policymakers. You know, they, they made a mistake, and Hanover made them pay for it, right? And, 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 that, and that's the, 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 the shrewdness, the cleverness of Hanoi, right? You, you, you show your visitors, uh, uh, you know, exceptional devastation, which kind of, you know, panders to what they want to see in the first place, right? And then you tell them that this is the situation all over northern Vietnam. So as you can imagine, right, these, these guys are very, very emboldened and radicalized and energized by, by what they, they, they see. But yes, yeah, it's, it's always, it, it's, it's inevitably day trip. You go to Thule, you go to Nam Ding, uh, and, and then, and then you're, you're back to, to Hanoi. And, and that's, so, and then the, the, the impression that's created is that the, the, the extent of the devastation in Thule is, is exactly what you see across Viet, northern Vietnam. And then, and then the other thing also is that, that while in Thule, right, the, uh, the, the Americans are told that, that um, you know, there were no targets of any military value in Thule, right? So, so that, that and, and then, but as you can see here, right, Thule is on a really, really strategic rail line. Uh, so uh, the supplies coming from China are taken to Hanoi. From Hanoi, they put onto trains or trucks, right? And this is the rail line. And they're taken down to the city of Ving down here. And from Ving, they're taken into Laos and then down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, so fully Namding, these are major, major transshipment points for supplies basically coming from China through Hanoi intended for the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Southern Vietnam. And so, so, so fully sits right on a rail line. And like other such cities, it was, it was obliterated. But none of this was explained to the visitors, right? It was, they were told that fully had no military strategic value whatsoever. Um, and, that's, and, and so that, that proved that the American bombing of Northern Vietnam was, 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 was criminal. The Americans were going after civilians uh, and we're bombing with for no for no for no legitimate reasons. And also, uh, fully is important because yeah, right, running adjacent to the rail line is is a road, um, uh, and 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 it's a road used by uh, truck convoys, right? So so supplies supplies coming from China are brought toward Hanoi, and then they're put onto trains, trains or trucks, and then brought down here to Ving, and then Ving is where you make the connection to the Ho Chi Minh Trail because the Americans are very heavily bombing this area right here. Uh, now, it's, it's really, really hard to measure the, the impact of, of those visits, right? I mean, it's, it's just like trying to assess the impact of the anti-war movement on American policymakers. It's, 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 it's an intangible, right? But, but as far as, as the North Vietnamese were concerned, this was very beneficial. So this is, this is, a, uh, from, this is a report, this is the report right here. This is a report, uh, this is Nguyen Zui Ching again, who was a Politburo member and foreign minister and, and really uh, one of the individuals who, who was closely involved in those visits. This is what he claimed in the report, right? So th this, this was for internal consumption. He said that, that American citizens who visited contributed to influencing the American real, Ho Fung, as well as to awakening the conscience of the American people of ordinary Americans. He goes on that their visits contributed to promoting anti-war sentiment in the U.S. and dividing the ruling elite until you... Uh, Pierre, excuse me. I, I'm sorry. You have five minutes until the question and answer session starts. Pardon okay. me for interrupting. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Lubna. Uh, so so uh, they, they divided until they were left, policymakers were left completely isolated. Uh, and then, and then U.S. citizens loved asking for our advice on how to struggle on our behalf and how to struggle together. And again, you see, right, this idea that, you know, these Americans came to save the Vietnamese. 
I put the agency on, on Hanoi. Hanoi is basically strategically manipulating these Americans to its own end. So, so that real agency here, the actors in charge are, are, are the Northern Vietnamese. Inside the DRVN, according to Nguyen Zui Ching, the, Amer the side of Americans contributed to the encouragement of the localities Americans visited. Uh, it can be said that the American people's movement against the war of aggression was one of the important factors that forced the US government to de-escalate the war and enter into negotiations, leading to the complete victory of our people in 75. The war inside America grew stronger um, owing to US visitors who just con contributed to the great victory of our people against the American imperialist oligarchy under the leadership of the party. Again, you know, th there's no way to actually verify those claims, but as far as Hanoi was concerned, this was meaningful. Now, legacy. Now, I would submit to you, um, and, and I, I really look forward to your thoughts on this, that, you know, the, the tours that Hanoi gives, um, the consistency within and between accounts by U.S. visitors, plus the fact that those visitors were there, right, like, like, like Vietnam veterans were there, right, caused the inception, the reinforcement of certain enduring myths about Washington's enemies in the Vietnam War. Basically, what, what I would argue is that some of these enduring myths that we still teach our students about the war, which, which we now know are, are not true, were, were basically introduced by, by these American visitors to, to Northern Vietnam. And, and, and these are some of the myths. That you know the idea that the, the NLF was fully autonomous politically, diplomatically, and militarily, right? For the longest time, we always thought of them as as independent. Now we know that's not true, but but that that's one of the points that comes across uh, in in the memoirs um, by visitors after their visit. This idea that the Vietnamese are heirs uh, to a long nationwide tradition of resistance to foreign aggression. And that you know the communists answered the nation's instinctive call to arms by coordinating the resistance to American aggression. All of that. It's all. It's it's also a myth, right? We now know that there's no such thing as kind of a pre-modern Vietnamese nationalism, but but that myth, I would argue, you know, was 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 kind of introduced in the United States and fiercely promoted by the people who'd gone to Vietnam. Um, and and again, it, it it's for for many people who teach the Vietnam War in the U.S. That explains everything, right? They were fighting for their country. And then, and then along those lines, right, you know, the other important myth is that, is that the communists were basically the sole bearers of the Vietnamese nationalist mantle, which made the, the Vietnamese who opposed them, namely the regime in Saigon and its armed forces, lackeys without any nationalist credentials, right? Now, thanks to new scholarship, we know that, that the South Vietnamese, that non-communist Vietnamese were legitimate, right? But all that kind of got obscured during the war because, because we came to conflate communism with nationalism. And I would submit to you that one of the reasons why you know, we, we, we came to that point is because of these, of these Americans who went to Vietnam and, and had seen for themselves right, that, that, that these guys were nationalists first and foremost. And consistent with that, I think that this whole myth that Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist first and a communist second was in part created and perpetuated by these Americans who went there and met him. Because of course, Ho Chi Minh would always tell American visitors that deep down he was a nationalist, right? And say nothing about his commitment to Marxism-Leninism. And then the last myth uh, uh, is, is, that, is that Hanoi, just like the NLF, were really eager to negotiate and, and were willing to accept any solution to end the war, but, but Washington and Saigon precluded that solution from, from, from happening. And then and I, would, I would basically tell you that these notions were basically unchallenged by Americans because no one had been there, right? Except for they, they, those guys had been there, right? But then in the 90s, some of us get to go, right? We become kind of the first North Americans to go to Vietnam since the Jane Fonda types. And then we study, we start digging through the archives and then we uncover this other side of the story, right? That, that I, I'm, 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 I'm sharing with you, with you today. Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Apologies for doing this via Zoom, uh, but thank you very very much. I appreciate it. I'll ask two questions and then let you just comment. One is, um, were there any uh, dissenters in this group? People uh, in in the files that you saw, people who went maybe a little bit later in the, the 1969, 78, 71 when. 
the POW issue had surfaced and the issue of torture and other uh, violations by the North Vietnamese were there. Did, did any of them get into uh, uh, the, the visits? And the second is, do you think that any of the people who went were double agents, were uh, CIA or others who wanted to get in to, to, to see what's going on? Um, uh, so in answer to your first question, I, I didn't see anything uh, about, about POWs in, in the files. And I'm assuming that's because it's a very sensitive issue and, and, and those would be, would be, would be separate. Uh, and so, so, so yeah, so I haven't, you know, I, I've, I've got files going up to 273, uh, but, but, but yeah, there, there's no mention in those about POWs. And I'm assuming that would have been handled by a different office than, 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 than a, a, a government office. Uh, as far as double agents, it, it's a good question. Uh, I, 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 I think that the, the vetting process is so rigorous that it would have been very, very difficult for, for, for let's say, you know, the CIA to kind of insert someone in there because the only way you could get in was by, you know, having credentials, right? Having a, basically a long history of, of being committed to, to, uh, 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 work on behalf of, of, of the anti-war movement. Uh, so so th there's no indication of that. But, but if anything, Tom, in answer to your question, wh what's really interesting is that when Salisbury comes to Vietnam, for example, right, he has an audience with someone from the, from the foreign ministry. And, and, and what, what, what is happening is, is that basically Salisbury is being pumped for information. You know what I mean? It's like it, 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 Hanoi uses some of these guys to get information about what's happening in America. So, so, so it, it, it's it's I think I think that the, the, the intelligence part again it, it's it, it's in it's it's in Hanoi's control. I, I hope that answers your questions, Tom. I, uh, as you know, I've done some writing myself on South Vietnamese diplomacy, and one thing that I came across that I found really inter uh, interesting and maybe unexpected. Uh, given the story that you've just told is an essay by Bernard Fall in the 1950s, where he talks about how at that time, South Vietnamese diplomacy was relatively more advanced than in Hanoi. Um, this is something Chris Gosha talks about as well, how difficult it was for North Vietnam to set up diplomatic relations, even inside the communist world. So I'm wondering if you have a sense of how it was that this extremely impressive diplomatic and political intelligence system that you describe uh, seems to have come into being so quickly. Like uh, uh, even on a mechanical level, how are they able to figure out what uh, courses a, a college professor in the US was likely to be te teaching uh, in, in a given year? That, that, that's a great, a great question, Sean. So, so the, you know, the, what Hanoi does uh, as early as 1945, it starts creating these friendship associations. Ironically enough, the very first friendship association that was created was the American Vietnamese Friendship Association. And, and the idea is to use these associations to basically reach out to people inside the United States or Americans outside the US who could kind of provide an in to, to the US. And then, and then following the outbreak of the war with France, then, then Hanoi will create a friendship association with the people of France, which is gonna pay really, really meaningful dividends, very, very meaningful dividends, and basically attune the communist leadership to the merits of establishing these sorts of friendship as associations. And between 1954 and 1965, in that 10 year decade before the American war, Hanoi is basically creating friendship association after friendship association. At the same time, it starts practicing what it calls cultural diplomacy and engaging in cultural exchanges with different countries around the world. So it's absolutely true that from 45 to 1950, Hanoi is, finds itself very isolated. But then starting in 1950, Hanoi basically starts to more aggressively assert itself internationally, at first inside the socialist camp and eventually 
in the third world and in, in the capitalist cap. And, and basically by 1965, largely because of the war with France, the Vietnamese have a blueprint, the, the communists have a blueprint for conducting people-to-people -people diplomacy. And, and they've, got, they've got diplomatic missions all over the world that have been collecting information about the United States, life inside the United States. And so, so, so when, when the American war begins, Hanoi has a, a very, very good understanding of what, of what the Americans are, of what they're capable of doing. And, and it is an understanding that's much greater than the understanding the Americans have of, 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 of Hanoi and of North Vietnam generally. But, but yeah, they, they uh, and I, I, I actually explained that in the paper, like the, the, the origins of, of Vietnamese communist internationalism and the origins of, of people to people diplomacy. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that they nurture and cultivate through the 50s and early 1960s, through the World Peace Council and, and through these various uh, uh, organizations meant to promote friendship with other countries and cultural exchanges with, with other countries. Um, I, I hope that answers your question, Sean. Yeah, fabulous, thank you. Um, Lori. Hi, Pierre. Um, Lori here. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask, you're talking here only about uh, Americans, but uh, were um, similar tours organized for people from other countries? You mentioned like the French fr friendship group uh, and uh, perhaps from people in developing countries. And if so, uh, would you know by any chance whether they changed elements in the visit? Or? That, that's that's a, a, a really, really great question, Laurie. Yeah, so, so for example, right, the, the, you know, France is a very, you know, the, the, the French left is, 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 is very well known in Vietnam. And sure enough, a lot of these guys will end up visiting northern Vietnam and they'll be, get, they'll be given the same tours. The, the difference here is that if, if as many of these guys are actual communists, they, 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 they will get to meet counterparts inside, inside North Vietnam. The Americans uh, uh, are, are, are only shown kind of the, the, the patriotic nationalist aspects of the resistance. Whereas the, let's say the visitors from France will, be, will, will, will get to have kind of more candid discussions about, 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 about ideology and, and about, about Marxism-Leninism and about, about the communist credentials of Ho Chi Minh uh, and, 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 and Pham Van Dung. Uh, the, the Vietnamese will also welcome uh, members of the socialist camp, delegations coming from the communist camp. Uh, and, 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 and it's really interesting, Lori. I, I, I really think that, you know, you would think, right, why do they need to, to do this people-to-people -people diplomacy with members of the socialist camp? Right? After all, they're getting everything they need from them. And I think it's because of the Sino-Soviet dispute. I think that Hanoi is really concerned about the potentially devastating impact of the Sino-Soviet dispute. So, so it, it decides, it doesn't take anything for granted, right? It doesn't take the aid of communist countries for granted. And it, 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 it practices this people-to-people -people diplomacy to endear itself vis-a-vis -vis every member of the socialist camp so that no matter what happens in the dispute between the Chinese and, between the, the Chinese and the Soviets, they continue supporting the Vietnamese because they're good people, they're deserving and appreciative of their, of their assistance. Does, does, that, does that answer your question, Laurie? Oh, that's great, thanks so much. Um, Alex? <laughs> Hey, Pierre. Hey, Alex. Um, so I, I have several questions. One is, did the Vietnamese government maintain any contact with these people when they returned to the U.S. as a way to, you know, continue feeding them information, you know, to, to, to continue? Or it's just a one thing, you know, you know one-time thing? Um, and then any efforts by the U.S. government, um, you know, through using different agents, to gather information from these travelers or discredit these travelers, you know, after they return from the U.S. Um, 
I mean, I, I, I'm asking this, uh, the, the first question in relation to, for example, I know that right now, for example, um, the Vietnamese government uh, have communist party so across America, especially near college institutions uh, operating, right, and, 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 and gather information and try to recruit professors and talk to graduate students, students and, and, and whatnot, and they have this whole channel. During the war, um, they, were they also doing this with, uh, you know, um, international students in America, in Paris and, and, and whatnot? So I was just wondering if you could address those questions. Alex, these, these are really good questions. So, so you know, I, they, they do maintain contact with, with their visitors uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll send them, you know, basically, they, you know, they, 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 Hanoi will publish a lot in foreign languages throughout the war, right? Uh, and, and, and specifically, you know, uh, uh, books and pamphlets and, 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 uh, and articles documenting American war crimes. And they'll, 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 they'll funnel those to, to their friends across the world, including in, in the United States. Uh, and and uh, I, I got to tell you, Alex, you know, it, it's, there, there is a manipulation going on, right, by the authorities. But at the same time, there are genuine feelings of appreciation for what these Americans do for the North Vietnamese. So much so that uh, I think it was, uh, it was last year, uh, one, one of the visitors, uh, I forget who it was, uh, but uh, I can't remember, but yeah, one of the individuals who'd gone to Vietnam a number of times during the war passed away last year. And, and get this, there, there was a ceremony held in Hanoi uh, in, in his honor, right? So, so Hanoi remembers its friends, right? So, so you know, I've, I've been kind of stressing the fact that the manipulation, right? The strategic manipulation of these guys, but, but at the same time for the people who hosted them, you know, there was a real appreciation that they were there to help. So, so you know, beyond the cold calculations of the regime, they, they were very real human bonds that were forged here. And, and, and yeah, and, you know, and, and just like, you know, the, the Hanoi always holds a special place for Cubans when they go to Vietnam or the North Koreans, it, it commemorates, it commemorates the anniversary of this anti-war activist um, who, who, who died recently by having a little ceremony in, in, in Hanoi uh, invi and inviting some of the people who worked with them when he had visited in, in, in the 60s and, and, and 70s. So, so, so contacts are, are maintained, but, but as far as I can tell, Alex, not to the point of basically trying to, to make these guys agents of, of, of the, 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 the North Vietnamese government. It's, it's mainly as a way of kind of get it, gathering information about what's happening in America and what the mood is in, in, in the United States. And then, and then of course, as far as the government is concerned, you're absolutely right. When they return, some of these guys will get debriefed by, by the government. Most are reluctant to, to share anything with, with the American government. Uh, a handful of them will, like Salisbury, for example, a, a few journalists will sit with American officials and basically share with them what they saw. Uh, but, but again, you know, Hanoi always made sure that on their trips, again, they only saw what Hanoi wanted them to see. Uh, and I, I didn't mention this, but for example, uh, you know, uh, any photo you took during your stay in Vietnam, they had to be developed before you left. You weren't allowed to leave with pictures with basically raw film. Everything had to be developed in Vietnam uh, before, before you left. So that was kind of a way to make sure that, you know, that you would, you know, the Americans, if you did decide to share information with the authorities, they wouldn't know that, oh, there's actually an anti-aircraft gun on that building over there. Um, so, so that's another reason why the, the, the tours have to be very, very carefully managed. They, they didn't want the, they, you know, they, they loved those guys and they indulged them, but they, they did not want them to see anything that could then be used against them, uh, uh, especially, you know, the, the position of military installations. Um, and then, and then, and then, and then, for those who refuse to cooperate, absolutely, the U.S. government would try to discredit those guys by claiming that they were agents of the regime, 
uh, by revoking their passports. For a while, the government would revoke the passports of those who, who went to, to Vietnam, um, and then of claiming that they were aiding and abetting the enemy. Uh, which, which again, if you look at that quote, right, by where, where, where Nguyen Duy Ching says, you know, wherever they went, they lifted the spirits of, of people. I mean, technically, you know, they were, you know, helping the, 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 the enemy. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the people who went paid, they did pay a price. Um, uh, they were threatened with jail sentences, although none of them, as, as far as I know, spent time in jail. They certainly were attacked uh, very, very vociferously. I mean, look what, what happened to Jane Fonda, right? Hanoi Jane and all of that stuff. And, and it, it kind of, so a lot of these guys would, 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 would be discredited upon their return as a way to undermine the legitimacy of their stories, which again, right, I, I really want to emphasize the fact that, you know, despite the fact that these tours were organized by Hanoi, the destruction was real. You know, the U.S. did kill a lot of civilians by bombing. The U.S. did destroy a lot of residential areas. So, 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 you know, ultimately, what's what's interesting about all of this is that is that you know the U.S. bombing of northern Vietnam really hurt Hanoi. But but what's remarkable is that Hanoi was able to turn a military liability into a political and diplomatic advantage. So, so, so that's kind of you know that, that kind of the shrewdness, the resort, the astuteness of, of Hanoi. But the destruction of you know was it was very, very real. And and anyone would have been taken by the sites that they saw on, on those on those visits. We have an online question. Do you have more examples of personalities going to Vietnam during the war? I am thinking about popular bands, singers, photographers and the way they contributed to manipulate public opinion. Any tips about what I should read, watch on this topic? There's a, there's, there's a couple of, of good books. There's a, there's a book by, uh, uh, it's called Radicals on the Road uh, by Judy, Judy Chun or something, uh, Judy Vu. Uh, anyway, Radicals on the Road that talks about Americans who went to to Northern Vietnam, right? But again, it's a very US centric approach. And it's about, and, 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 and it talks about, and again, right, it talks about the North Vietnamese as the only real Vietnamese. And, and, and that's, you know, and, and it, it makes no allowances for the people in the South, you know, legitimately fighting for, 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 for a non-communist state. Uh, there's also, uh, um, yeah, there, there, there's a handful of books uh, that have been written about 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 the anti-war movement and Americans who went to northern Vietnam, but it's it's a very very U.S. centric approach. No one has really looked at this from 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 the Vietnamese approach. <clears throat> the best book I would recommend for you, uh, it's it's a history of people to people diplomacy, written by a colleague of mine, Harish Mehta, M E H T A, M E H T A. Harish, H-A-R-I-S-H. And it, it's about basically uh, uh, communist people to people diplomacy. And he gets into some of that, of these, of these, of these materials. Okay, Laurent Cesari. Hello, Pierre. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, first, you, you showed us that the North Vietnamese were most, more cost conscious than the Americans. And uh, another thing, if we think about the circulation uh, of strategies, uh, and do you know uh, uh, if, uh, of course, the North Vietnamese could have found all that them, themselves, if, but do you know if uh, they had uh, inklings about um, the people's supremacy of uh, um, the, the Chinese communists during the Second World War, for instance, or or if before that, uh, people's diplomacy of the Soviet Union in the interwar, because obviously it's the same kind of uh, methods. So do you know if there have been a circulation of strategies? Merci, Laurent. Merci bien. Uh, C'est bon te revoir, Laurent. It's very nice to see you again, Laurent. Uh, yes, so, so the, and, and that's, the, 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 the Vietnamese are learning a lot from uh, basically Soviet Chinese cultural diplomacy, right? Uh, and and so, so, so they're borrowing extensively 
from 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 some of the of the, of the methods that were used by the Soviet Union after the revolution and the Chinese after after 1949. Absolutely. Much of what they're doing is informed by the past experiences of, of, of other, other communist countries. And, and yeah, reaching out to, to uh, uh, progressive groups and individuals overseas is entirely consistent with, with, with you know, Soviet behavior after the revolution and Chinese behavior after, after 1949. So, so and, and, it's, and, and that's why I would argue that, that, that by the time the American war begins, you know, the, the leadership in Hanoi is so well prepared. You know, on the one hand, it's got, it's got its own experience fighting France, right? And mobilizing all these resources, military, political, diplomatic, cultural, to defeat, to defeat France. But at the same time, right, it benefits from the experiences of the Soviets, of the Chinese, of other members of the socialist camp who are more than forthcoming in terms of telling them what they've done, what worked for them, what did not work for them. Uh, and, then, and then they also will send throughout the war, the Vietnamese themselves are going to send people overseas to gather information. So for example, I found a document where at one point, the Vietnamese sent someone into North Korea with the purpose of studying the, what, 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 what they call the struggle spirit of the Koreans during the Korean War. So, so, so this person in the 60s goes to Pyongyang, travels around North Korea with, with instructions to visit the DMZ, to visit certain areas and try and get a sense of exactly what the North Koreans did during the Korean War to basically manage their people and then engage the international community. So, so, the, so Hanoi is very, very active in all of these things. Thank you. Um, I would like to close this session with a quick comment of my own. Um, I don't want to name any names, but I interviewed um, one of those prominent anti-war activists. And she said to me, weren't the North Vietnamese smart to use Olaf Palma? And I was thinking, duh, weren't they smart to use you? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone.